Alrighty, looks like we are up and running. Hello, everybody. It's uh, your favorite Sega que, que tu conté. Uh, yeah, no, dang it. How's it pronounced again? Sega que tu conté. Uh, that guy you know, Miyumini, and I'm back with another stream because I'm trying to make this a regular thing that I'm doing. And uh, yeah, today uh, we're going to be consistent again. Going to go ahead and do some Valheim. I'm going ahead and launching that right now. here. All right. And yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and start the game. Stream to guard, and we're playing in the streamlands. I think the last time, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, uh, last time we gathered up some stuff, and I think we were finally starting to get a foothold in the Black Forest, if I recall correctly. Right now, just hanging out at the house. Let's take a look at the map. The elder's over here, so we need to get over here. That's what we were gonna do. My current plan is to get materials for a boat, and then we can go ahead and sail on over to there. And uh, yeah, let us see what all we need. Got a little curfew in me. First, what do we need? Uh, first, we need to even get the recipe for that. So, I know, I think, yeah, we'll need the bronze nails. Hmm. I need something else. Oh, I'm sure the uh, recipe will pop up as we get to it. Got a lot of tin. What were we doing? I think we'll go ahead and do. We'll try to make a bronze sword here. That way. You know, we get a little bit more practice with the uh, choppy, choppy, stabby, stabby stuff. Uh, all right, so need das bronze, and we're gonna need more copper. That's what I'm realizing. So uh, let's see, how much copper do we need? We need fourteen copper, I believe. Yeah, because bronze requires a two to one ratio. Okay. So that tells me we need to find some cap. There was some copper over here. So we'll go ahead and, okay. It's too early in the day. We'll go ahead and take this and put it in here. 
No. Yeah. First, we're gonna load that up before heading out. process while we're booting the boot. Deer power. Deer powers away. Stone is this again? Mm. This is the tail stone. Yay! Let's see here, I suppose we should probably do a brief introduction here. Uh, so, a couple of weeks ago, uh, got a dog. Come here, buddy. Let me introduce you. Oh, oh. Ah, everybody, this is Vulpix. Say hi to the stream, Vulpix. Yeah, you're a little cutie. Incredibly spoiled brat, I love him. Like you were. Don't you shake your head no that you weren't. Continuing on with the thing. I'm sure your fans will enjoy seeing you later. He's just sniffing my stuff. Okay. 
I was thinking about leaving the deer alone, but it ran right up to me. Yeah? yeah? What's that? You come in the microphone to sniff? Yeah? Yeah. You just want attentions and doves, don't you? Now he's gonna go hang out on the couch. Now he's just hanging out underneath my desk. I would have sworn that I had made some sort of, like, path or whatnot over here last time, but I'm guessing I must be- Oh, yes, yes I did, and here it is. Here's one I pre uh, prepared last week. Do I even need deer meat? I don't think so. I think the reason why I'm actually hunting deer is one, prey instinct. Two, uh, I think I need leather for the first good ship. been here? Seems that way. Well, yes, obviously, because there's a big old friggin' road right in the middle here.
stuckfish? Yes, you are. Your mistake. A troll fish. A fish for trolls. Uh, this fish is a nuisance in the local streams. So, yes, it's quite the troll. Let's see, that's a pig. Huh. What's that over here? Sanctuary Tower. forest biome, so we should be getting some copper popping up here. Oh no, the road's blocked. The road. nest right there. Alright. And then Sanctuary Towers over there. Oh, park the cart. Inhabit, yeah. Wait. Let's actually go ahead and do a little road building here. Sanctuary towers over there. Yep, here we go. Now we can spend a quick night here. There we go. Take a nap. Wait until morning. Sleep of the river and dreams are live fish. You wake in the morning with your net empty. Each bird sings sweetly on Tuesdays. So we're going to take care of these dwarves. That big thing right there is a troll. So we're going to try to be sneaky about this because he hasn't seen us yet. Where is he at? There he is. And he's seen us. So we're just going to go ahead and kite him. And we'll use the fire arrow. That's why we're going to try to kite him, because otherwise this is not going to go well for us. We'll go into kind of a quieter area, like the meadows. And I'm dead. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm glad I set your ass on fire. here. Keep an eye out for that big blue meanie. Wait. Yeah, I'm not blue. I'm not blue. Dabu D. Dabu D. 
probably still nearby, so I gotta be careful. Got all my stuff still. Let's see if I can fix my stuff up real quick. I can I can't fix my frickin' tunic. Ugh. What is this? The Middle Age? Oh, wait. Okay. There he is. since I got some surprise on him. I'm just gonna use some of my knees bent running around advancing behavior. Oh god, I made a huge mistake. Since it's raining, I'll switch up to the other arrows. Let's see, because I'm guessing their the fire arrows aren't going to work quite as well when you know it's being put out. Slightly cheesy, them I feel like, but you know what? He two shot at me last time, so I'm kind of okay with. set it boosts your um, stealth stat because trolls have a very lovely habit of sneaking up on your asses okay so I'm gonna need to take that back to my house if I'm gonna make that stuff So now we're going to go back to the cart and we're going to keep on with the um, forward progress to uh, search for copper. Because otherwise we're just going to have to make this trip all over again. So, new. running around with, you know, the whole knees bent advancing behavior that I did see some copper. I want to go up to here. 
the stomp. Stumpy, stumpy, stomp. Alright, log. Somebody throw things. There we go. Alright, let's take a look at this stone here. What's this stone say? Ah, stone say. Ah, let all who read me beware of the Grey Dwarves, the Skulkers in the Darkness, the Soulless Ones. They are born from rotten rainfall. They spring like mushrooms from the smoking soil. There's nothing on their tongues or behind their eyes. Nah. Those who fear nothing should still fear them. Okay, I'll come back to you in a moment. Fear me! You should still fear them. When the soul of a murderer or a great sinner rots under the ground, it makes a hollow cyst which draws rock and wood and moss to it. It gathers up the peat into flesh, braids reeds into bone, and takes rags for skin. It should not walk, but when the night comes, it walks. Should you who read this see one with a sword in your hand, lance it and let it out, or put it to the torch, for it fears the flame. That's a nice Christmas. We shall call this one the Dwarf Stone. This copper? No, this is stone again. Yay! And you are also stone, and you're stone. Ah, oh, shiza. Okay, so every once in a while, you'll get attacked by, like, swarms and stuff. Um, so you can either fight them like I'm going to do here, or you, if you have like a better base, you can just kind of wait them out. But they just keep on coming for like a minute or so, a minute or two. And the reason I believe why it does this is the game it's getting tired of you not moving on to the next boss. Which I'm trying, I'm trying. Oh, I could eat another bite, could I? Well, right now I'm trying to run for my life. its name is a dwarf shaman. They both like to poison you and heal their buddies. Okay, the forest rests again. That means that there aren't going to be any more of them coming up. So I just gotta clear out this mob.
frickin' shaman. And I'm dead. But I died in the area, so hopefully they'll clear out and I'll be able to get my stuff back. This is why I'm gonna burn the forest to the ground. No, um. <coughs> okay. Stupid sexy Flanders. Why did I die? Was it over here? It was over here. Thank you. Running, running, running. Christopher Squawkin, I'll talk to you in a second. Yeah, that's right. You don't like that, do you? And now you're the one who is ganked. My, my, how the turns table. stuff back. You have been invaded. Monsters will lay siege to your camp from time to time. Strength of arms does not guarantee you victory in these situations. Build a strong defense to weather out the storm. Thank you, Boyd. Squawkin' away! Alright. Now there was other stuff to pick up. Where did the cart go? Uh, there's another nest over there. I'll get to you. Ah, there's my cart. Looking very roughed up. Nope. Alright, so I'm going to gather this up. I'm gonna smash this with an X. if I'm over here. I can just hang out in there until the forest rests again or whatever.
Sleep is a river and dream are live fish. Uh, don't put them in your butt. Okay, now take three. It's probably too steep an angle. Yeah. Oh, yep, there it is. I want some copper for my schmelter. Horse you rode in on, dwarf. <laughs> Last minute dodger. Okay. Um. Hmm. Well, in the name of getting more towards the elder, we'll go this way. this tomb. Maybe that's some copper? Please let it be copper. I've got so much mining to do anyways once we do find it. Hey, Fox. Hey, Vixen. Uh, nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. The um, long, luxurious locks of hippie hair are uh, long and luxurious. And I keep on thinking to myself, you know, self, I should probably get my cut, mine cut too, but I don't really have much of a reason to cut it, so it's like, yeah, I'm just gonna let it go. Downside, though, is that, you know, since my hair is so fine, it's very easy to be like, oh, he's balding, because, you know, that's not an anxiety I haven't had for a couple of decades now. Since there are actual eyes here right now, let me see. Oh, thanks! Come here, buddy! Probably not uh, paying attention. He's probably sleeping on the couch right now. Thank you. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, got this shirt uh, a while ago. Oh, hey, hey, buddy. Everybody, this is Volpix. Volpix is a little Shiba Inu, about a year old, and he's a brat, and I love him. What do you say? You say hi? <laughs> 
the public love you. Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> Alright. You want down? Yeah? Oh, you just hanging out in here? Scritching, scritching, scritching the ears, ears, scritchings. Scritching's good. other day I had to go to work and he likes being outside he loves going for his walkies and um, you know he got a little bit of walk time and uh, you know came back and he was out in the yard and I had to get my stuff together to go and I go out my front door and I'm hoping that you know like he doesn't see me or anything well he was sitting at the front gate you know so totally saw me and I did not know this, but apparently Shiba's, uh, Shiba Inus do this thing called the Shiba Scream. He let out this, like, yowl of, like, utter, utter betrayal. It's like, how can you go for walkies without me? Um, so, I, needless to say, I felt guilty my whole shift. So, you know, some spoiled brat got, uh, got a pup cup at the end of the day. Brought him home a little whipped cream. But, uh, yeah, it was like, ugh, it was so bad. Um, I, we hadn't heard him make, yeah, yeah, how could you? I am, I am a heartless bastard, you know. I, I go and I do this jobby work thing and I don't bring my doggo with me. And, you know, even though he would have been bored off his rocker, you know, just sitting in a coffee shop. Um, yeah, yeah, no, always, always take him with always take him with I will and and you know he we're we're totally in of uh, in the situation where if we're going somewhere he's coming with but it's like you know couldn't take him into work it's unsanitary um, but uh, but yeah good luck explaining that to him just yeah again the utter betrayal in in his yowl it was just it was kind of hilarious you're a little bit dramatic you take after your papa that way um, you know what I'm hearing? A lot of excuses. Yeah. Ah, well, if it makes you feel any better, I'm about to pay for it. Uh, yeah, let's not go farther into uncharted territory. Let's go into more of a safer spot. Eee, eee, I want to live. Yeah. And then um, last night, uh, so we've had Vulpix for a couple of weeks. Uh, before that, we were looking at um, kitties, too. Uh, yeah, Daddy is definitely going to get his comeuppance. Um, we were also looking at uh, cats, and we saw one that was, you know, this little cute orange kitty named uh, Cornbread. And Cornbread had... Um, some potential adopters so it's like oh okay well you know he's a cute cat you know think not gonna get him because he'll probably get adopted um turns out no uh the uh, people who were looking at adopting cornbread did not so you know we got an email the other day saying oh hey yeah cornbread's still up for adoption you're next in line if you want we can set up a meetup okay um, decided though, um, we went and did that yesterday. Um, there were two concerns. One, uh, would allergies act up? And then two, um, you know, Vulpix, cause he's still got a lot of puppy energy and, um, and Shibas are apparently known for having a pretty high prey drive. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, he wouldn't hurt the cat or anything like that um and so we went we met uh we met uh, cornbread and um didn't seem to trigger allergies or anything but then okay for step two we went ahead and brought vulpix into the foster's house and he wasn't like going after the cat or anything but he had his very 
strong puppy energy going. Um, and uh, so we decided, no, it would be unfair to Cornbread to put him in kind of a stressful situation. Apparently, Shibas can be good with cats, but one, they like being kind of the alpha, the top dog. Um, and the cat has to be kind of like a bit more laid back. And I wasn't really... Uh, Cornbread seemed like a total lover, but he wasn't... You know, it felt like it would be a bit too much for him. Um, so that plus... So what we're figuring, um, Vulpix loves people, super friendly with people. Um, and he likes other dogs, too. But... Um, Shibas are very big roughhousers, so he will he will go and play with big dogs and stuff like that, um, and give as as good as he gets. Um, the problem with that is again his puppy energy; he's a bit too intense. Um, so we have a neighbor dog, you know, big beautiful blonde. Uh, I don't know, lab, or, you know, it's got the floppy ears and kind of looks like a, uh, uh, you know, typical medium-sized, you know, blonde dog um, named Henry. And Henry is a big, lovable goof, you know, kind of dumb, though. Um, and Vulpix, the first time they met, he kind of threw himself at the, at the fence, and when they're really excited... And, or frustrated is typically when they make noise and he he was wagging his tail and everything so he wasn't being mean but he was just being really freaking intense and it kind of freaked Henry out a little bit so we're gonna you know somebody's got some obedience classes in his future because what I'm figuring right now is we'll probably get Vulpix to the point where he and Henry can be outside having yard time at the same time and then we can kind of look at, at doing a cat again, because right now, yeah, just needs needs to kind of chill out a little bit. Um, apparently he got fixed three, four weeks ago, so we're kind of hoping that some of that, um, not aggression, but testosterone will kind of ease up a little bit. Um, Vulpix's fosters uh, mentioned that he basically ignored... Um, uh, girl dogs, uh, but was very, you know, active with, uh, with other, uh, uh, boy dogs. Not anyone's yard slash territory. Oh, yeah, some were neutral. Yeah, yeah, um, the, uh, and he has been improving every time he's in, uh, interacted with, with Henry, um, so I do think he is learning that, oh, okay, I can't be flinging myself at at the fence because then yard time's done um because he's you know really freaking smart um but uh yeah so i'm hoping that um that he'll uh learn and eventually we won't have to worry about oh hey henry's dad is is coming home we need to bring Vulpix in so he doesn't you know terrorize henry um and I think if I think the last time uh, they kind of interacted, Henry was also engaging, but you know, so he wasn't like freaked out. But it's just like they're really loud and like in each other's face, and it can sound like they're fighting, even though their their tails are both wagging during the whole time. So they're they're just roughhousing, but it's it's very intense. Um, and so yeah, we're gonna gonna work on that and hopefully as he gets a little bit older he'll kind of mellow out a little bit as his testosterone levels drop he'll mellow out a little bit and yeah oh, for dwarf's sake you loraxy sons of bitches hey don't dig up the rocks There, had him stun locked. Yeah, um, yeah, because apparently, um, Shibas are 
yeah, they, they learn pretty quickly, and but they're stubborn. That is that is their reputation, and I can pretty much agree. Yeah, our experience with Vulpix is he does things because he wants to do them. If they happen to line up with what you want, great. If not, okay, he's gonna. You gotta convince him. <laughs> And then, like the other day, smart dogs are assholes, which is why we love them. Yeah, yeah, no, he's a he's he fits in perfectly with with the family. You know, it's like I was telling the boyfriend, it's like you realize you just got us, but in dog form, right? Um, so yeah. And what's funny is I think I've told uh, you guys this story, Fox Vixen, but in case I haven't, and I'm pretty sure I haven't told it on stream. Um, the second night we had him, um, you know, uh, Sabriel, the boyfriend, um, went ahead and let what let Vulpix out into the uh, yard for uh, uh, end of the night, um, you know, do his business, stuff like that, um, before bringing him in. And Vulpix, like doggos do, loves outside. And so he didn't want to come in. So, you know, boyfriend had to try to grab him, and Vulpix is fantastic at staying just outside of fingers range. Um, but, you know, boyfriend managed to get a hold of his harness, and at that point, Vulpix uh, kind of looked at him like, oh, you think you got me, do you? Slipped out of the harness, ran to the far end of the yard, did like a little dance like, ha ha, I got away! And then um, and then, uh, came back to, to my boyfriend and, uh, and let him put the harness back on him, but he still made him, uh, he still, Vulpix still made my boyfriend, uh, carry him into the house. So he's gotten better about that. We've been leaving the door cracked open a little bit and he'll come in whenever, you know, he likes, um, this morning it was kind of rainy here, and so, you know, he, apparently they don't like being wet. Um, so bath time will be fun. Um, but uh, uh, he came in, you know, he had a little bit of yard time this morning, but it was kind of drizzling out. Um, and, yeah, boyfriend came in, uh, sat down at his desk, and Vulpix just, you know, 30 seconds later, is like, yeah, outside sucks, let's go in. And just came on in, so, yeah. Tell me you got video of Seb chasing Vulpix. Oh, um, no, unfortunately, it, it happened. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think. I think I was already asleep at the time because, you know, I'm either working or gaming or napping. Those are my three modes. Um, but uh, he did do the same thing to me the other day. Um, Minnesota being just incredibly, oh, what's the word? I'll go with mercurial. Um, with its weather. Um, <laughs> disappointment. Yeah, I know. Um, but uh, Minnesota, being very mercurial, uh, decided three weeks ago to give us like eight, uh, no, I think it was like 15 inches of snow, big, heavy, wet, sloppy, heart attack snow. And then two weeks ago, it then decided to get us, uh, give us like 80 degrees, um, freedom units, which I'm trying to think that's about 25 in science units. Um, but anyways, really freaking warm, like summer temperatures. Like there was no spring. It just went from winter to summer here, um, for like two, three days. And then it's back down to, I think it was felt like 36. So that would be two in science. Um, but uh, anyways, on one of the hot days, I decided, okay, I'm going to take the trash out, you know, so I'm gather up the trash. And I grew up with a uh, dog that was a bolter, um, you know, if he got out the door, if he snuck past you, he was just gone. You know, he would go and be gone for like the better part of an hour and because uh, Pomeranian. Um, and to be fair to the dog, we 
were a cat family and, and did not really know how to, you know, deal with dogs properly. Um, so, you know, the, the dog wasn't particularly, like, house trained or anything like that, but, you know, um, like I said, that's, that's on the owners, that's not on the dog. Um, but anyways, um, so my experience with bolting dogs is when they go, they're freaking gone, and you have to kind of track them down. Um, and so, anyways, the other day, I am gathering up the trash, and I figure, okay, well, I've got to go out uh, into the alleyway behind the yard, so I'll let Vulpix have some, have some yard time while I'm doing that, and I'll keep an eye out, try to keep him in the, in the yard, not let him get out, and I thought my leg foo was, was pretty good. Um, yeah, I was rusty, because <laughs> I opened up the gate, and he just whoop, slipped right on past me. Like, he made contact with my leg, but he just flowed like frickin' water around me. Um, and he got into the alleyway, and it's like, shit! You know, um, and, yeah, he was, first he runs down a couple of blocks in the alleyway, and then he runs up a couple of, or not blocks, a couple of houses in the alleyway, and then he runs up a couple of houses in the alleyway, and I'm like, oh god, I, and I'm not chasing after him, because if I know that if I go chasing, yeah, if I go chasing after him, he's just gonna bolt, and it's like, that's just gonna make things worse. Um, so it's like, crap, okay, put the trash in the trash can, go and grab his leash, and I just try to keep visual on him, and I notice what he's doing is he's not running like hither and yon, he's basically bouncing back and forth between the two neighbors' houses. It's a game at this point, at that point. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and yeah, he is he is definitely just dicking with me, basically. Because he's a brat. Um, and um, the neighbors on, you know, everybody in this freaking neighborhood has a freaking dog, I swear. Um, but, uh, you know, he goes down a couple of houses, and then he runs past me to, you know, a couple of houses on the other side, and, and he's... Um, sniffing uh, around the neighbor, the one neighbor's, like, fence across the alleyway. Um, and so not the next door neighbor, but across the alleyway from, like, Henry's house. Um, and, you know, then he decided to, okay, you know, he was done toying with me, and, and he just kind of laid down, and I don't know if it's because he w it was hot and he was tired at that point or if it's because he's like okay i've had my fun i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and let them win now and and um and he let me put the lead on him and we came back and you know good to go but uh, i'm pretty sure he let me win at that point because he seems to very much be like oh i'm doing this because i want to that is very much his personality isn't that right buddy He's just laying on the floor, and he's like, whatever, you're just yammering on. But yeah. Yeah, and um, and then at, like, the one-week mark or whatever, the, the foster asked for, like, um, for, like, an update. Yeah. Yeah, he let you, he also clearly loves you because he came back. Yeah, that's what the foster was saying. Um, the, the foster mentioned that, like, okay, yeah, he got out a couple of times with them, and... Um, you know, it took about a month before he's like, yeah, I'm going to come back. Um, and, and just came back on his own. So, yeah, he's a spoiled brat, but you know, he's our fur baby. He is definitely, definitely, you know, fur baby. Um, which is funny because I'm kind of a cat guy, you know, uh, if you know me, you know me. Um, and yeah, I, it, you know, the meme, like dad and the dog, uh, dad doesn't want to get the dog, dad and the dog. And it's like, you know. Haunted and chewy or whatever um yeah 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 wrapped around his finger is he a cutie oh my god um and then the other day i was in target um and you know i decided to pick up some stuff um like you know another chew toy for him to to have um, something that wasn't, like, super high-pitched squeaky, um, and 
actually, let me go ahead and grab it here since this is a good spot. One second. You wait right here. So I got him this. Just a second, buddy. Don't worry. So it's got crinkly bits in the tail and in the wings. And inside, like the neck, it's got fluff for, you know, if your dog is one that kind of destroys toys. But the squeak uh, in the main body is kind of what I love about it because it's kind of a lower pitch and not as, like, annoying, aggravating as, like, other squeaky toys. Here. And he's such a smarty that um, I'm going to give it to him now. He knows, like, which specific spot to poke with his muzzle to get it to squeak. Yeah, there you go, boy. There you go. And so you might hear some squeaking or crinkling. That's him playing with the chicken. Oh, you're going to... Oh, I, I had the temerity to touch your stuff. You're going to take it out of the room now? Okay, that's fair. That is fair. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, he's, he's, he's a good boy. He's my good boy. Um, but, uh, yeah, let's see what else, what else has, um, pretty good jumper too. I didn't, you know, it's like, okay, makes sense. You know, dogs have to jump around in, in nature and stuff like that. Um, oh, you bringing the chicken back? Yeah. Now you got to poke the the body, buddy. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. There we go. Uh. almost afraid he's getting bored of the chicken at this point because that's the other thing like when we're out having yard time and stuff like that you know throw the ball and you know throw the stick and um, when he's done he'll run past you and then drop it and that um, if he wants to keep on playing with like the ball he'll bring it to you and you have to you know tell him give and he'll actually give it up um, but uh, um, if he's like, nah, I'm done with the ball, instead of bringing it back, he'll run. Yeah, he'll run past you and, like, to the side of the house instead of to the, you know, back of the house or whatever and uh, drop it over there. So it's like, oh, okay. And it's not, he doesn't, he's not constantly wanting to do the same thing over and over again because apparently, because they're so intelligent, they have kind of short attention spans. So it's like, oh, God, it's me in dog form. Yeah, he's super quiet too. He doesn't really make any noise unless, um, yeah, like super frustrated or super excited. Um, he'll occasionally have just kind of like, Arr! you know, noises and stuff like that, but that doesn't really count. He's not a not a yapper, not not a big uh, barker. Um, we tested the doorbell today. He could not give two shits about the uh, about the doorbell. He was more interested in the fact that the. Uh, that, you know, Sabriel was at the door, you know, was by the door. He's like, oh, does this mean I get to go outside? Um, you know. Yeah. And now, he's just, you know, hanging out underneath the, uh, underneath the desk. Yeah. Um, he's started, um, he's doing the typical dog thing where, you know, he's taking shoes. Yeah, Shebas don't bark much. Yeah, yeah, and... I was a little bit anxious. The whole part of the uh, dad doesn't want to get a dog thing um, is because with the experience with the Pomeranian bear, uh, the, the Pomeranian was a yapper. And, you know, and so I was like, I really don't want to have to deal with that. I don't want to have to worry about the dog barking, you know, when the doorbell rings or if I'm doing a stream like this, I don't want to have to edit out a bunch of dog barking and and that and no no 
Wow, he's super quiet. Um, you know, he'll typically... He'll typically... Um, when he wakes up in the morning, he does a lot of... Um, sort of noises, because, you know, big stretch, and he's yawning. Um, and what is interesting is when he does bark, like when he's playing with dogs, um, or trying to play with dogs, um, his bark almost sounds like a branch breaking, like a crack, that sort of thing. It's it's not like a typical dog bark. I mean, it is and it isn't. It's, you know, it's it's small dog barking, but it's it's got that sort of crack quality to it, which, I don't know, I find it really interesting because I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that a, a dog bark like that before. So it's like, oh, you are just full of surprises. Okay, let's see. We are back. And let me put this rock here. What's that? He's hearing something. Yeah, he's probably bored. He's checking stuff out. Come on. Coal for the coal god. Alright, Kappa for the Kappas. The thought, uh, the thought did just occur to me. It's like, oh, come on, Bullpix. Dad just was saying how, how smart you are. Uh, yeah, that's that's why he didn't uh, do it, because he's just wanting to make me look like a liar, because he's a contrarian. Gets along very well in this house. Let's see here. All right, let me try getting some of this stuff put away and whatnot. So again, y'all in dog form. Yep, yep, absolutely, absolutely. It's it's like, yeah. At now I don't have to read like sci-fi where people get like, oh, I got turned into a dog, or you know, what what would life be like if you were a dog? It's like I already know. It's like yeah, because I live with it. Yeah, and I am I am hopeful with his behavior and stuff like that because I don't know maybe I'm just reading into things, but uh, it seems like every time I take him for a walk and we go out and we do see another dog, his behavior improves just that much more, just a little bit more each time. So um, I think he's kind of figuring out what I'm looking for and and stuff like that. So he's he is trying to, you know play by his own rules, but he also likes to test the boundaries, which, I mean, yep, <laughs> seems about right. Let's see here. And now, suddenly I feel like I've gone all mute because I'm not talking about the dog anymore. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I've also been, um, on Facebook, my family has, like, a little chat group or whatever to, you know, kind of keep in touch. And, um, yeah, I've been blowing that up with, like, oh, here's some more stuff that the dog did today. And, um, my sister, uh, sent me a little message, and it, it was, like, a, a reel or whatever, um, and, uh, it's of, um, this groom looking down the aisle as his bride is coming and he's just having like this emotional overwhelming moment um and it's like you know uh dog owners when their dog does basically anything and then it cuts to instead of showing the bride it shows like the dog in like a little froggy pajama costume and it just goes eh? <laughs> um, and it's like yeah 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 guilty as charged guilty as charged um they didn't tell me to stop, though, so I'm still blowing up the group with, like, Oh my god, he's such a cutie! Because, <laughs> you know, he is. Um, yeah. Now let's see here. Okay, we'll do 
that, we'll do that. Eh, heavy. Don't I have more? Oh, I need three more copper. Eh, dang it all. Crab gamut. Back and forth, back and forth. Everyone knows it's slinky. Then try to gather up all this wood. Find a spot for it. Alrighty, I think. Okay, that should be enough. And copper. Chameleon. Oh, right. It's like, why is it not doing the thing? It's, well, because your inventory's full. Alright, now what else is needed for sword? We need wood. Lots of wood. Oh, right. Now, where am I gonna get wood? Hey, how about that pile of wood that you just threw out there? Yeah. Let's see here. All right. Now a sword. So now, when I get to practice in my stabbing, I've got a much longer reach. Go ahead and use some of this tin to make a butcher knife. I'm not planning on getting any animals anytime soon, but you know, good to have, good to have. And then fish, go ahead and make some fish. Let's see, yeah, we'll make both of them. Oh, I need to make more deer meat, too. Hey, boy. You coming on back? Was the living room boring? I mean, I'm pretty boring, too, so, you know, I don't know what you really expect from me. Let's see. Food, 45 to 35. So, yeah, we'll swap that out. I'm thinking, of course, he doesn't really have, like, a spot. But I was thinking about, um, one of my favorite, uh, streamers has, um, a camera for his pet tortoise, and it, you know, cuts to, to the tortoise's enclosure and whatnot. Um, and I was thinking about possibly getting something like that set up for him, but, you know, dogs have this thing called moving around, so I don't know if it would be very useful or anything like that. Damn it. Burnt one of the fish. This is. That's what I get for daydreaming about Doggo Cam. Yeah, now he's just over here underneath the desk. And that's, you know, another thing. When he's when he's done, you know, just chilling out, he'll uh, just hang out underneath the uh, Either under my desk, under the boyfriend's desk, on the couch, which is his couch. <laughs> um, and, you know, fair enough, we tend to be at our computers most of the time anyway, so it's not like he's actually interfering with us sitting or anything like that. 
Um, I'm a little bit annoyed that I burnt the fish again. Alright, what was I doing? I was going to take raw ore, like this tin. Fill it up. sorts of gear. Let's see, I'll do a troll cape. And that's it. Great. I'll just go ahead and put that here for now. Let's see. Plants, plants, plants. Do that there. Sweet, I can upgrade stuff. What does it take to upgrade the helmet? I need more deer hide. Like that. stick to smack things with. It's a really good stick now. It was a big rock. Okay, that's empty. Nope. The deer is done. Deer stuff. Okay. Yeah. And then. Let's see, was there anything there or there? barrels. I can make some jam, though. Where's my jam? Okay. Got about 50 of those, so I'll get back over 50 fire arrows. That'll be enough arrows for now. Oh. Do I not have enough wood? Apparently not. Well, let me first take a nap here.
Alright, good morning. Let's see, there's nothing there. Break this. Day 29. <laughs> Heavy. Alright, that's good. Do we have anything over here? I feel like there should be something else that I'm missing. Like there's something else I can make. But what it is, ain't exactly clear. Top that off. That's all good. Make some more honey. Could do poison resistance. Yeah, that would work. Poison resistance. Let's see, I think these make eight each. Oh, that's all the honey I've got for now. So I'll put that there. And what was the barrels? What did those need? Do I even have that recipe yet? Here's new. Stream to guard does not know how to make mead yet. That's that's another strike against you. Okay, need ten of it or some pig. Big, 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 big. Okay. Now, can I do a gate yet? Not seeing it. No. So I'm missing something. But what that is, I'm not sure of. Other thing that um, that shows just kind of how smart Vulpix is. Um, so yesterday was waiting on um, Henry. Um, he was out in the yard, um, and okay, we want to make sure that we're good neighbors and that Henry gets uh, yard time and without you know being terrorized by the little psycho next door, and. Um, you know, so we're, we kept Vulpix in while Henry got his, his yard time in. And, um, Vulpix, um, he's, I've got this really big window right to my left here. Um, and it comes down really low. It's a, like the, the, the windowsill is only like a foot, if that, from the, uh, from the, uh, floor. So he can see out the window. Um, when I open it up and, you know, let the light in. Um, and <laughs> he'll start, like, scratching at the window and, like, whining to go out and stuff like that. And it's like, no, buddy, we can't do that. But, you know, I'll, I'll compromise with you a little bit. I'll crack the window open so you can sniff the outside sniffs and get the information in that. Well, that wasn't good enough. You know, he was still whining and whatnot. Um, but also, he was, like, pushing his paws against the screen to, like, see if he could, like, knock it out. <laughs> and and then get out, um, and then he was also kind of biting at the at the window sill to see if like he could like shift the uh, window open more, because he's a tricksy one, and I loves him, but I'm a little bit worried that he is going to like figure out how to get out one of these days, and it's like ugh, it'll be game over at that point. Um, for the front gate, he's figured out. Um, We've got, you know, those typical chain link, you know, fence gate things. Um, and the gate has that kind of U-shaped, Y-shaped uh, uh, latch. You know, you just pull it up and, you know, put it back down and it holds the post and it keeps the gate from opening. 
Well, the one in the front has, you know, kind of settled just a little bit so that if this is the post, instead of the gate being flush, it's ever so slightly like that. Just a little bit. But it's very close to what his skull is, what his head can fit through. So, again, a little nervous that uh, he'll slip his head through and, you know, get out and go. So we have bungee cords, like little uh, little bungee cord hooks that are keeping it keeping it um, closed. And he hasn't escaped or anything like that, but whenever he's out in the yard, a lot of times he'll go up to those bungee cords and, like, play with them and, like, you know, bat at them or he'll, like, try gnawing on them or whatnot because he's seen me... Uh, I've, you know, when I've taken him for a walk, um, I've undone those hooks so he knows that, hey, that's the thing that's keeping me in here. Again, he's too smart. And so it's like, you always have to be on your toes with him. It's like, you, you, you let your guard down and he will get out. He will get away. Um, you know, the, the only saving grace is that, yeah, apparently he likes us. So he'll come back. Um, but uh, one of these days, I just know he's going to be like, I really want to go and just go. Um, yeah. Uh, he's, yeah, because he's a smart boy. He's a brat, but he's smart. That's okay, because I love him. All right, let's see here. I think I've done enough faffing around here. I think we're good to head back and get more kappa. Let's see here. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna get some kappa. And I'm gonna try doing a little road building to here and follow the shore there until we get back to the road that's over here that leads to Sanctuary, Sanctuary Tawa. But yeah, let's see. Now, time for some more road music. It's, uh, my life has been fairly dog-centric for the last two, three weeks here, so, you know, that's what I've got going on. Um, let me see here. Always wanted a Shiba, but will likely never, likely never will own one. Well, for what it's worth, Fox, you know, you now have a, uh, a Shiba nephew. Um, <laughs> you know, feel free to, uh, you know, demand uh, family photos and things like that whenever. not think this through. Yeah, and I think um, I've got a cousin. I've always wanted to own a corgi because of, you know, okay, incredibly nerdy reasons. I love Cowboy Bebop, um, and I love mine, you know, the dog from Cowboy Bebop. Um, but I've got a cousin who has a corgi, and Apparently that one's a bit of a, a bit more of a brat, um, and it's like, oh, okay, you know, just more kind of like a f more frustrating dog to kind of own. So it's like, oh, okay, so it looks like we uh, kind of lucked out by by having the cousin be the one that that got the <laughs> slightly brattier dog. So it's like, oh, okay, well, thanks, thanks for taking that hit, cuz. Um, but uh, I don't know. I haven't actually met the dog, so I have no idea whether or not that's true or if, you know, if I'm uh, just hearing slander on the on the behalf of the dog. Let's see here. Do, 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 do.
Let's see, is that a deer or is that a pig? I think that's a deer. Because otherwise, yep, that's a deer. Because if it was a pig, its head was coming way too high up. I can't believe that actually hit. I would have sworn that that was going to be too low. Um, but yeah, um, as far as owning um, a Shiba, from what I can tell, um, from what I've been reading, yeah, incredibly smart, incredibly stubborn, um, and you always kind of have to be on your guard because they will, they will mess with you. <laughs> because, again, they're really freaking smart. Little troll dogs, which, I mean, it kind of uh, makes the whole doge memes that much better because it's like, oh, yeah, Shibas are actually kind of like that a little bit. Uh, they also really like being um, involved. Like, so that's one of the other reasons why, you know, Sabriel and I are, are whenever we go somewhere, you know, we take him if we can because um, they like being included. You know, even if it's just, uh, oh, okay, we've got to go to the store, you know, I'll sit in the car with, with uh, Vulpix and, you know, he just watches people, you know, in the parking lot and stuff like that. Um, and the other thing, um, like when we've gone on walkies and, and he's met other dogs, you know, sometimes, you know, other dogs will be very vocal and barking and yapping and whatnot. And if they're, like, across the street, you'll just kind of look at them like, well, what, what are you doing to the thing? Yeah. Um, and if he's close, then he'll, you know, like, if he wants to play and stuff like that, he'll then start barking back and, and like, kind of engaging with them. But, you know, if he's, if they're just, like, over there, he'll just be like, oh, yeah, that's another dog. All right, then. I'm watching you, other dog. You know, and just almost, I don't want to say disinterested, because he's clearly paying attention to him. But, um, but he doesn't necessarily, like, pull on the lead or anything like that to, to be like, no, this is what I want. You know, he's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, because it's like, okay. We go for walks and, um, you know, he'll sniff yards and, you know, pee on the trees and the fence posts. And, you know, if he does a toosie, okay, I'll go in and pick it up because I'm a responsible pet owner. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, a lot of times he'll want to, like, go to the backyard because that's where the other dog is or whatever. And all I have to do is just kind of keep my feet planted on the sidewalk. And he'll, you know, try to go back there. But, he'll, you know, after two, three tugs, he's like, oh, okay, I'm. this is all the farther I'm going to get to go. Let's move on to the next house. You know, and we just keep on going. So he picks things up very quickly. That's the, that's, you know, another example of the, you know, um... He's smart because he's he recognizes when, you know, he's not going to, you know, get his way and he doesn't necessarily you know, it's not like a fight with him. You know, he'll he'll you know, use emotional manipulation, but um but uh you know, when he realizes that it's not gonna work, he's you know, he's like, Okay, okay, we're moving on. I need to be a little bit more disciplined myself, though. Um, I uh, was giving him some of my food. Uh, we both were when we were eating, and he'll use emotional manipulation. Welcome to parenthood. Yeah, yeah, little fur baby, little fur brat. Um, but anyways, I was I was making. I'm gonna call it a mistake. Um, I was giving him some of my food. Um, because, you know, oh, he's such a cutie. Um, and the other day, I made a pizza. And, uh, you know, split it with the boyfriend and that. And 
what he was doing is he'd go to the boyfriend, get a little bit of food from him. He'd come over to me, get a little bit of food from me, and just bounce back and forth, back and forth. It's like, little, yeah. Again, he's clever. Um, but I need to uh, be a little bit more disciplined myself and be like, no, you're not going to get any food from me. Um, you know, because I don't want, like, if we have guests come over, I don't want him uh, climbing up on people and, uh, and you know, demanding food. Because even though he, he'd get it, he'd get it. Um, and, you know, they'd love him for doing it, too. But it's like, no, I, no, no, that's, that's not a good habit to, to get you into. Um, I don't want you expecting that. You know, so maybe if I do give him you know, some of my people food, it'll be like in his bowl or whatever. Um, you know, so he can still give me the, uh, the puppy eyes and, and the emotional manipulation and, but you know, I'm not going to just give it to him right here. Got to have some discipline. All right. Can't believe that actually hit. Absolutely. Um, and it's funny because for the longest time, he wasn't particularly food motivated. Um, that's the other thing that kind of makes me a little bit worried about giving him food, uh, human food. Because um, it's like, okay, he wasn't very interested in, in, um, in like the dry food. He eats it, but, you know, like day two or three, you know, okay, I got up from, from sleeping and, you know, it was like quarter to eight or whatever um and i'm like okay well i'm hungry i'm gonna get myself something to eat and uh, well he hasn't eaten since yesterday i'll go ahead and pour him some food and you know poured him some dried food and you know he looked at the bowl and didn't really care you know he's like okay i'm gonna go lay on the couch now um and then like three hours later he decided oh okay yeah i'm hungry and he ate his food and it's like oh okay um And yeah, so I've, I found that interesting, is that um, he is fairly interested in, in what Sabriel and I are eating, but, um, you know, I think that's all only because, you know, we have it. And it's like, hey, yeah, I want some too. Um, because yeah, if, if we get him just like, oh, hey, here's a random treat, we'll be like, even if he really likes it, sometimes he'll just be like, oh, okay, yeah, okay, I'll have one of my treats, that's fine. Um, but yeah, I've, it's that that really threw me for a spin too, though. The the fact that he wasn't like super, oh, hey, you got food, and you know, like up on, on you right away, or, or that you couldn't really get him to... Um, like come in because oh treats okay you know like he's like no i want to you know stay outside and run around in the yard and you know i've got the zoomies dad i need to i need to run <laughs> and uh yeah that that was just really interesting to me because i hadn't ever really met and well any animal that wasn't food motive motivated like that and I kind of like it that way a little bit. Like, I don't want him necessarily being super up in people's business because food is in the area. All right, let's see here. It's a little bit dark.
go. Put that there. Yeah, there. That there. I'm gonna go downtown. Gonna see my gal. Gonna. I don't know. want to. There we go. Oh good, I do have the other one up there. So I'm gonna actually go up to pig's hall up here at the top of the hill and rest there for the night so I can A, get the rested bonus and B, get rid of this cold debuff. I think the other thing I'm going to do is get another cup of coffee while I'm doing that. One thing I did notice about Vulpix, and maybe it's just because it was a new situation, new surrounding, stuff like that, I did think he was a little bit jumpy. Like, I'm gonna make the, uh, I'm gonna make myself a uh, cup of coffee, like I said here, and um, I've got a coffee grinder, and he's very jumpy, like, when I start grinding the beans up and whatnot. Um, let me see here. All right, sleeping there. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and stay corner here, and yeah, um, yeah, uh, let's see, back at it, and got me, got my Senka refilled, and, uh, oh, you are so jumpy, um, me putting the coffee cup on my desk, you know, while he was sniffing stuff, he was like, mm. um, yeah, continues to not like the coffee grinder, even though, um, you know, it's like I showed him the whole time what I was doing. It's like, okay, I'm putting the beans in the thing that you don't really like, and you kind of leave when it's going. So it's like, man. Um, you know, it's like when I picked up the lid thing that I pour the beans into, he's like, oh, wait a minute, I don't think I like this. And, you know, but he didn't actually do anything until, oh, hey, there's, um, you know, it's making noise. I don't like that. Um, do you not like the competition? Is that what it is? And we'll come back down here. Oh, I should have brought those deer trophies up here while I was at it. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Okay, there's the cart. Also did not like um, before today's stream. I, you know, hopped in the shower and washed my hair and everything. You know, cute jokes about, oh man, if this is what you look like after you bathe, what sort of swamp monster were you beforehand? Um, you know, a fish doomed one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he also did not like the uh, hair dryer, which I mean, okay, fair enough. But uh, other thing that I found interesting was he doesn't like box fans question mark um it was when it was really super hot here for a couple of days um i busted out the uh box fans to you know just kind of keep air flow going and kind of keep it cool in here um and he didn't come into my office here to like hang out or anything he you know i had to put up a 
a little blanket to kind of cover underneath my desk. I've got like a little two coffee table things that are kind of acting like shelving. Um, and he likes, excuse me, he likes to hang out under there. Um, but to get him to come in here and like hang out like he normally does, um, when the fan was running, um, I had to kind of block off his space from, uh, from the breeze, so I don't know if he doesn't like the wind, but it's like, okay, well, buddy, I don't want you to have a freaking heat stroke, though. Because apparently, that's another thing, Shibas do better in cooler temperatures than in warmer temperatures. So, like, 60s, 50s and 60s, they do better in than, you know, 70s and 80s. Which, I mean, that's fair. And it's a good thing we live in freaking Minnesota, then. Um, direct this one what's this one called oh pigsbury tower gotcha yeah because that's pigsbury over there that's what i've named that settlement because it has pigs and berries and fancy free there's a dwarf up there we will see if he sees me moving right along to do to do, -do, -do ah crap okay first off that goes there Okay, so there's a troll up there. Troll! So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my spawn point to Sanctuary Tower over here. That way if I do get ganked again, I'll just spawn there instead of back at Pig's Hole. the devs give these guys. Oops! And we'll trend back towards the meadows here. Where it's like graylings and boars and necks and now one big ass troll. that freaking broadside of a barn Ugh, shooting at where he is not where he's going to be there we go run 
run! I cannot believe that didn't hit me. Watch like 10 seconds from now, the game will be like, oh yeah, it did hit you, dead. just saw me take down a troll and you're like, yeah, yeah, I think I can take him. At least you get dwarf eyes from him. That's, that's what I keep on telling myself. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do with bronze is I'm going to make an X, because I should have done that earlier. Because that way I can get... What's the type of tree? Is it... No, it's not spruce. It's that... Oh, birch. That's it. It's that white bark over there. Come on, before the tide. Yeah, gotcha. Trollfish. <laughs> I hear you, dear. Oh, I see you, dear. How about a little fire, scarecrow? She didn't suffer. All right. All right, so we'll go up to Sanctuary Tower. Leave this here for a second. Fix it first. There we go. Pick up the loose resources that the troll mined for us. Come on. Come on. You know you want to. So that is fixed. Dead goes dead, dead goes dead, little bit of dead, little bit of dead. Oh, the shona, oh, the shona, oh, the shona, schnitzel valve. Go ahead and close my door here so he can have his privacy. One second. It's okay, buddy. All right. So now it's just me and Vopix in here. All right. And of course. 
course, now that the door is shut, I'm sure he'll be all like, Ooh, I want to go out now. I don't want to hang out in here with you. You smell funny. Because that's just the contrarian sort of doggo he is. Yep, yep, there he goes. Looking at the door. All right, I'll let you out. Jeez. Oh, you want out? Get your chicken. Yeah. There we go. All right. Now then. Oh, right. We're getting more kappa. Ah, oh, there it is. should do is I should probably build myself a crafting station here so that the next time my pickaxe breaks I can just fix it here which is aka what I should have done the last trip this too exposed? No. Awesome. Okay. Give me the copper. Much like the other copper deposit, I'm just gonna really get what's here on the surface. I don't really plan on going too deep here to get all of it. Um, I figure later on, when I have a better pickaxe, um, I can do more copper mining, but I just don't wanna spend a bunch of time digging around like that. energy region.
nice little bit of shelter from the uh, from the rain. Just you know, active fire in the middle of my very flammable wooden structure. Makes sense. Let's see here. Hmm. And since this part can be a little bit tedious, and I'll, you know, when I put this up on YouTube, I'll kind of edit it so it's a little bit faster. Um, one of the other things I wanted to do, and the reason why I kind of consider this a just chatting stream, um, is being kind of a big old history buff and things like that, I did want to give the opportunity to, um, if you guys have any questions about, like, you know, What's the deal with World War One? You know, feel free to ask. Because um, I figure that is an area that I know a decent chunk of, and even if I'm wrong, you know, it's like okay, it's interesting to to uh, kind of gain new knowledge. So, I don't know. I'm not I'm not against being like, now wait a minute, I just read this other thing, and it's like, hmm, okay, I'll have to look at that. If that made sense. Basically, I'm saying, like, hey, feel free to ask, like, history questions or, you know, things. Like your opinion on the Bronze Age collapse and if you feel we are at the beginning of the Information Age collapse. Okay. Um, so, and I'm doing this off the top of my head which is another reason why, you know, I will encourage you to read up on it in, in case uh, in case I'm just flat out wrong. Um, Bronze Age Collapse, um, prior to, you know, even the ancient Greeks and Romans and antiquity, as it's called, um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, there was a fairly sophisticated, like, international trade network kind of set up uh, between, like, the Mycenaean Greeks that lived on the island of Mycia, um, the Egyptian, I think it's the New Kingdom at that point, because Egypt is freaking old, um, and um, I'm trying to think if it was one of the Persians or Babylonians or... Um, Neo-Assyrians, yeah, there were like three or four major, you know, kind of players, and they had a decent um, trade network kind of going. Um, they were trading in copper and tin and things like that. Um, their tin was coming from as far away as like England and uh, Afghanistan, um, so actually pretty well-developed network. And then one, at, historically speaking, it just kind of suddenly collapsed. Um, and there are records from, you know, cuneiform tablets that were baked when the city that they were in uh, was set on fire uh, by a group that is just kind of known as the Sea Peoples um, because they came out of the sea. There's not a lot of information as to really who the hell these people were. Um, some theories think that there was kind of an agricultural disaster up in northern Europe, like in Germany and stuff like that, and so these people were migrating to kind of, you know, get away from the disaster, um, as, as, you know, people have done throughout history. You know, life sucks here, let's go somewhere else where life isn't so shitty. Um, 
it would make sense that, hey, we've there's, you know, this, you know, kind of world set up down along the Mediterranean. That's pretty nice. Let's go ahead and join in on that. Maybe we can make a better life down there. Um, so there's that sort of thought um, as far as, like, why these people suddenly show up and kind of start wrecking things up. They're not quite... It's, it's a little bit interesting. It's, it's not necessarily like barbarian hordes coming down and rampaging all over the place, but it's not, it's also not like a refugee migration sort of situation. It's, it's, it's shrouded in, um, mists of time because it's, it's, um, because a lot of the records were ruined and destroyed by, you know, the collapse. Um, and let's see and it creates this period um, the next time we have really well written records that kind of document what the hell was happening in this region is when we start getting things like Homer and Plato and you know classical Greek um, and the time in between there is called the uh, Greek Dark Age um, which I find kind of an interesting term because it's like okay you know First off, it's it's not necessarily a good term. It's it's uh, the term dark age because you know people were living, people were thriving, people were doing their things. Um, when a historian uses the term dark age, it really means more that we just don't have a lot of information as to what the hell was going on here. Um, unfortunately, it's you know commonly understood as oh it was a terrible time to be alive, and it's like eh, maybe maybe not. Um, but anyways, uh, comparing that to uh, if I feel like we're at the beginning of an information age collapse, the cop-out answer is time will tell. Um, but, uh, but um, well, let me see here, because a lot of our digital records um, from, like, say, the 80s and 90s, you know, those early CD... Um, ROMs that, you know, were burnt uh, using, you know, Windows 98 sort of computers. Looks like uh, they are starting to kind of decay a little bit. So, it would be, if those were our only sources of, like, records, that, yeah, we could be in the beginning of a uh, information age collapse, but... I don't think so, because at this point we have so many copies of, you know, records and information. I think even, even if we do have, like, the records that are decaying and are being lost um, happen, I think there's so much information from so many sources, and it's so widespread that... I don't think, oh. oh, there we go. I don't think it would, um, I don't think it would be as dark. Let's see, I'm referring more to the system's collapse and less another dark age. Um, okay, so like with the world and the situation that it is it currently in, I still think no. Um, like, right now is a, the, kind of the world order as it is. Um, the post, well, post-Cold War, but even post, you know, post-war um, order. The way the world is, you know, that when it was set up kind of after World War II and then kind of redone or, like, after the Cold War. I think it's being challenged. Um, and I think that, let's see, but I do think we are going to see a breakdown of empires. Uh, oh, uh, Dark Age. I don't think it will lead to another Dark Age, to be honest. I think we are past ever having another Dark Age again, unless something truly apocalyptic happens. I do agree with that sentence. Um, but I do think we are going to see a breakdown of the empires and a system collapse that will see nations look inward. Uh, not in our lifetime for what it's worth, but I feel like we're at the beginning. A lot of polish being lost on the marble so to speak 
And I do see that. I do see that. Um, I don't think... I don't think we're in necessarily trouble. Um, I don't think, like, okay, maybe, you know, 200 years from now, you know, future historians will be like, and that's when the, you know, uh, post-Cold War order began to fall. Maybe. I could see that. If it were to happen, it would probably look kind of something like this. Um, but if you look at the situation, um, like, the biggest challengers to the status quo right now are kind of Russia and China. You know, um, not to be like, oh, we've always been at war with, you know, Asia or anything like that. Um, but, you know, those are the two kind of biggest powers that aren't really benefiting from the status quo. Um, and so they would like to challenge it and change things up because that's what every nation does at any time. You know, they try to improve their lot in life. Um, and if anyone was going to do it, I think it would be, let's see, I'm thinking closer to 100 year-ish, to be honest. Um, yeah, like 100 years from now, you know, well, the world changes. It always changes. The, the you know, the only constant in life is change. Um, you know, that's the only certainty in life. Um, but... The, you know, from where I'm sitting right now, you know, without any sort of, um, any sort of <laughs> insider knowledge or anything, um, you know, no wibbly wobbly, timey wimey sort of stuff. Uh, was it NASA that put out the next societal collapse that sooner than that? Um, no, I think that was, God, I think it was some sort of Ivy League school that, um, says like the next societal collapse is set to be like the 2040s or something like that um but um as far as kind of the u.s hegemony over the current world um i think that will continue on for a while um i think if there were to be a multipolar world it would probably be europe kind of reasserting itself and separating itself from the United States, um, kind of like what Emmanuel Macron wants to do. Um, but even then, Europe benefits from the status quo. So sure, they'd like to, you know, be considered a, a big boy again and not, you know, America's lackeys. Um, and China would like to, um, China would like to be once again, kind of re uh, regain their historical central um, position in the narrative, as it were. Um, you know, the Chinese name for China is actually the Middle Kingdom, you know, because they were the center of the world up until, you know, the uh, 18th century, the 1700s, where, um, or was it the 19th century, 1800s? You don't see China rising as a new world leader. Short answer, no. Um, they'll be a major player. They'll be a very big competitor. Um, the problem that they will face is that nobody likes them. Like, who are Ch uh, the People's Republic of China? Who are their close allies? Like, oh, Russia. Russia is not exactly a big dog. Like, they they bark a lot, but, you know, Ukraine is showing that that, you know, uh, that they're not as scary as they like to pretend. Um, you know, God, what was it? The term that I saw was Russia went from being the second most powerful army in the world to being the second most powerful army in Ukraine. Um, uh, India has been pretty chummy on the surface. Actually, no, China freaking they're at each other's, well, not throats, but they are constantly bickering over their border. Um, China is trying to, China is trying to actually do, uh, this thing called the String of Pearls, I believe it's called, where they're trying to build up kind of a maritime, not empire, but like network, trading network, to kind of get around and not necessarily encircle India, but they want to be able to, 
uh, being a strategic strong point um, where they can kind of neutralize India as a threat. Um, and um, yeah, um, yeah, no, I stand by the uh, statement that Russia is not world power. Um, they're the, the Russian state as is, um, the Russian state as is, it's way too corrupt. Um, you look at, you look at, um, like all of their struggles right now that they're having in Ukraine, um, is because it's, it's basically a mafia state anymore. Um, and has been since, you know, Putin took over. Um, if you look at Putin's history, he first kind of fell in with the Russian mafia in Yeah. Oh, God's no, but that's just it. I'm curious if we aren't seeing Russia as one of the first dominoes. Um, not really. I think Russia is going to, um, like the best case scenario, let's say they manage to take all of Ukraine and, and they overthrow the regime, you know, there and, and essentially re-annex it. Great the world is still going to have them super sanctioned and not trade with them and their lot in life is not going to get any better um you know it's already backfired on them because they wanted to kind of scare nations away from nato that's that's officially their whole oh ukraine is too close to nato it's like well you know congratulations sweden and finland just uh, applied for members um uh, the point of a system's collapse is that as the gears break down, the machine breaks down. I could see this breaking Russia down even further with the way things are. I feel like Putin isn't going to be in power much longer. That one... Putin's situation is one of those, it's impossible for them to fall from power until it happens. Um, when regimes like that fall, it is, they're invincible, they're invincible, they're invincible, and they turn to powder. So, possibly, um, it doesn't look like it from the outside, I'll say, but it's it, very, very possible. Um, you know, one too many oligarchs decide that they don't want to fall out a window, and, you know, sure, maybe they can get something together. Um, it'll be... The key thing there is once Putin falls, kind of the whole system will collapse, um... Right, so I can kind of see another Saddam happening. Yeah, and hopefully, if slash when that were to happen, um, we have to do a much better job um, than we did in the 80s and, you know, the aughts with Iraq and the Soviet Union. Um, because the neoliberal Reaganism, just let the free market handle it, it'll be fine. No, that doesn't work. That didn't work in the 1920s, it didn't work in the 1990s, it didn't work in the aughts. Um, if Putin were to fall, I think the West, Europe, the US, you know, uh, Japan for, for purposes of this discussion, the, the status quo um, needs to be ready to kind of get the Russian people's way of life improving so they're not suffering. Because part of the problem, part of the reason why you see people like, you know, okay, Godwin's Law here, but, you know, Hitler or Putin rise up is when you have kind of cultures that don't have a long history of, uh, don't have a very long democratic tradition, it's very easy for, like, strong men to show up and be like, oh, I can fix it, just give me all this power and, and I'll make you feel important again, you know, see, see. Trump um, and um, and when um, yeah you think the US should get involved if Putin falls then or the US should get involved short answer yes we should have kind of a a Russian Marshall plan ready to go um, because if you look at Europe okay after World War one all these empires fall and we kind of go in our isolationist mode and we kind of withdraw from the world and we uh, we just kind of let the free peoples of the world you know determine their own fate and 
it led to major upheaval, major reduction in the standard of living for, you know, people in Germany and the former Austro-Hungarian Empire and that. Their lives sucked. And it's like, oh, is is this what democracy is? I don't like this. Oh, hey, here comes this, you know, charismatic strongman who says he'll fix everything. All we got to do is just let him do what he wants. Okay, yeah. And, you know, in the short term, it does look like it's working. Um, and, but what winds up happening is when you give those sort of egos like full reign, they just keep on wanting to expand and expand and expand and consume. And you get, you know, this revanchist, irredentist, um, you know, you want to right historical wrongs. Like, um, Hitler wanted to get revenge on France for, you know, the Treaty of Versailles, um, you know, and... Uh, Putin wants to rebuild, you know, Russia's preeminence because, you know, they used to be one of the one of the poles uh, of the of the world. They were a world power, and they're not anymore. And we were embarrassed, and NATO is making fun of us. They want to restore Russian honor. It's like okay, um, and that tends to just create, you know, just tyranny, uh, tyrannical regimes, um, uh, authoritarianism, uh, tends to bloom in that sort of situation. And yeah, it, it winds up, you s eventually the, 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 um, liberal democracies, the, um, uh, you know, you wind up having to go in and do it anyways. Uh, but you know, millions of people have to die because you didn't just do that right the first time. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I think the collective West, the, you know, the people who are currently sanctioning Russia right now, I think we need to be ready in case Putin does fall that a new Russia can rise from those ashes, something that's stable, something that, um, you know, has better human rights, has a, um, has, uh, you know, gives the people an actual say in the way their lives go, the way their country is run. Um, cause Putin currently is relying on the apathy of m your average citizen in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, you know, if those two cities were starting to feel the pain from, uh, you know, the invasion, um, he'd have trouble which is why when you look at where Russia's military losses are coming from, where those people are originally from, they're from these random boony flyover country areas. Um, but yeah, so a joint rebuilding effort. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, because otherwise we're gonna be back here in you know, 20, 30 years from now because the next Russian irredentist will be like, oh, we will, we will complete the, the legacy of, of Putin the Great or whatever, you know. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it'll be expensive, but it's better in the long run to spend the money right now rather than having to, A, do this all over again because ultimately the only way you're going to kind of break that cycle is to do kind of what the Europeans did. Um, Europe has this reputation of having a very um, robust and generous um, benefit state. And part of that is to prevent people from getting too discontented with their lives and supporting strongmen. Again, um, that's part of the reason why they're, they're so generous with their, with their social safety net. Um, it keeps the masses from embracing that authoritarianism that no we have to go out and get all the stuff for ourselves it's like no no we can all work together and just be kind of chill and everybody can can get along we're just going to do our things they're going to do their things over here and you know if you're struggling hey there's plenty of ways to get help and and get support and that's kind of why they do that because um, they learn the lesson that you can't just let the market handle everything because the market is about profit. That is the reason why 
the market exists. It doesn't exist to promote human flourishing. It exists to increase profits. And yeah, the state should care about the well-being of its people because that ensures their, well, A, it ensures the state's, um, the state's survival, but it also prevents kind of humanitarian catastrophes. And I feel like that was a bit rambly, but yeah, yeah. Um, short version, yeah. Um, I think that while Russia is challenging the current status quo, um, it's not going to be successful. I think um, the status quo is demonstrating quite well that no, no, you're not going to get away with this, buddy. Um, that was part of my fear when this all started was that we were going to just, oh yeah, no, we'll let him, we'll let him take Eastern Ukraine. We'll let him take the Donbass, you know, just, just to get him to shut up, you know? And it's like, no, you have to kind of, Putin is a bully and he has to be kind of punched in the nose to get him to back off. Cause if you don't, he's just going to come back in like eight years and do it again and again and again. Yeah, appeasement two, electric boogaloo. Yeah. Um, although I will go easy on Neville Chamberlain in that the whole point of appeasement was not to prevent war. It was to buy time for England and France to kind of gear up. Because um, it's like, you know, Chamberlain, oh, peace in our time. But he comes back from Munich. The first thing he does is he puts through a rearmament bill in through Parliament because he's like, yeah, no, he's going to violate it. He's going to come back again. Um, you know, it can be argued that Germany used the lull between, you know, Munich and the invasion of Poland more effectively. But, you know, the did appeasement work? No, because it didn't um, prevent a war, but... If you view it as that wasn't the point of it, then yeah, it was kind of successful. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, you kind of have to deal with the problem right away. You know, you can't, you can't kick the can down the road, which unfortunately the um, liberal democracy, the, the liberal world order kind of likes doing that because, you know, from a democratic system it's it's easier to not make the tough decisions uh, because when you make a tough decision you're going to piss people off and when piss, people are pissed off they tend to vote you out of power um, which is you know a flaw in the system it's definitely a flaw um, but it's understandable at the same time Let the next candidate handle it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, that's also part of the reason why I don't really like the presidential term limits, um, because it's like, no, you gotta, you gotta fix this thing now, because, you know, yeah, you can't let the next guy handle it. You, you need to fix it. Otherwise, you're going to be the one that, um, you know, appease the the bully. Um, Slightly distracted from all the schmelting that I'm doing. Yeah, and that's also um, the kicking the can down the road. That's part of the reason why climate change is, is such a um, has been such a uh, struggle as well because it's a long term thing, and it's you know. We could have, we could have fixed it, you know, back in the 80s and 90s or the aughts that, or the teens. And now we're, it's, we are going to see some rapid climate change and it's going to suck. Um, you know, instead of curbing emissions, we now actually have to start thinking about actually pulling carbon out of the air. Um, 
because we've already kind of blown past the uh, the tipping point. Um, let's see. So no term limit, but re-election every X years. What's to prevent to slip into dictatorships, func functional monarchy? Um, kind of the same forces that already prevent it. Um, you know, the United States went for almost 200 years without any president breaking the three-term line. Um, some presidents did it because it was tradition. Some presidents did it because they lost re-election. Some presidents died in office. Um, in an ideal world, you know, my wave a magic wand and suddenly the, the Constitution is what I say it is. Um, what I would prefer doing is having kind of an annual confidence vote where like, oh, hey, citizen, do you approve of the job that your congressman, president, senator is currently doing? Yes or no? Um, if yes, great. We'll see you next year. If no, nothing happens right away. Um, it depends on the office. Um, the system that I would like to do is, okay, if a congressman gets a thumbs down from their constituents. Okay, that triggers a regular election the next the next year. So like every year it's just one candidate, yes or no. Um, do you like the job they're doing? Yes or no? Um, if yes, like I said, okay, great, we'll see you next year. If no, then, oh, here, just a second. Um, if no, then for the House seats, okay, other parties, you think you can do better, field your candidates, and we'll have an election, regular competition like we do now. Um, I would say with presidents that we should do, okay, if they get two no's, okay, that triggers another election. That way, theoretically, a presidency could be as short as three years. Um, and then, you know, senators, originally they were designed to be a bit insulated from public opinion. Um, that's why originally they weren't directly elected. They were appointed by state legislatures. Um, that's why they have six year terms. Um, so they can do things that, yeah, it might piss off people back home, but if it's the right decision, it gives them a little bit more flexibility. Um, so in my hypothetical system, if a Senator gets three thumbs down, that triggers another election. Um, so theoretically, a senator term could be as short as four years. Um, let's see. Let's see, what's to prevent? Uh, which political system is best at dealing with long-term problems in your opinion? Um, that is kind of one of the strengths of, um, of a monarchy, of a, um, of a non-limited, um, structure because it's going to be the same people that are dealing with things, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years later. Um, that is one of the benefits. There is an incentive for more long-term planning. Um, uh, let's see, which political, uh, do you think we, the people have the attention span for that as we exist now? Um, short answer yes um because the whole point uh because the my hypothetical system has it's not an immediate changeover if like people are pissed and like the mob is angry about shit you know they can vote no we're not happy about this but nobody gets toughed out of power right away um you know the congressmen who get a thumbs down they have a whole year to be like oh okay my people aren't happy I'm going to change things up. I'm going to make the argument that actually I am doing a good job. Um, and, you know, here's what I'm doing. I need to fix my messaging problem. Um, compulsory voting, I assume. I hate the compulsion part of it. Short answer, I think it's better. Um, I like what I think it's Australia does with their compulsory voting, where basically if you vote, you get a tax break. Like, 
you know, your taxes are reduced by like a flat, I don't know, I think it's like $300 or something like that. I'd be okay with that because it's like, oh, hey, you know, libertarians, Republicans, you want to lower your taxes? Go vote. Um, yeah, oh shit, that's go gangbusters here, lol. Yeah, 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 I think I think that would be the way to get uh, that, that'd be the way to get the other side of the aisle on board. Um, the biggest thing, though, is in my system, it encourages, um, you know, if everyone's voting every single year, A, you could make it a federal holiday. Um, you'd see voting numbers blow the fuck up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing is, um, yeah, if we made voting day a national holiday, it would give, it would lower some of the barriers that currently exist to you know, people voting, um, which is why I don't think the, the Republican Party as it stands right now would agree to it because their power kind of requires, the conservative movement's uh, power kind of requires people to be apathetic and or prevented from voting because they're not a, um, they're not the majority and they know they're not the majority. Um, and so much like we see in Putin's Russia, they want to keep people disengaged. They want people to not group up. They want to promote the, you know, individualism. I don't need help from nobody. Because if you look at the history of life, the biggest advancements are when things come together. You know, we, for, let's see, life has been on this planet for about 4 billion years, I think. Yeah, because the sun's about five billion, the earth is about four and a half billion. Um, the first fossils of life are about four billion years old, and the fossil record is single-celled organisms for like three and a half billion years. It's only like 600,000 years ago, or 600 million years ago, that you get the Cambrian explosion, when you start getting multicellular life. Um, and you see all sorts of, you know, advancements and things like that um the great powers of the great nations of history come from you know come from people working together um you know because when you have people working together you can specialize you know jeff can be a, a farmer you know jose can be you know a, a blacksmith and uh, you know, Ted can be a, um, you know, the mad alchemist that's trying to think up new things and new ways of doing stuff. And Mary can be, you know, the person that's coordinating all of this. And, um, you know, the, it, it allows for people to focus on what they're really good at and not have to spend a lot of time, you know, dealing with shit that they're maybe not very good at but they have to do like they have to go down to the river and have to get water and things like that um and yeah so all of these advancements like you know the if, if you want like a, a star trek future um you need people working together um and the current i'll say libertarian mindset of you know, the Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrug sort of thing. It's like, no, we need to let the, you know, geniuses just run the show and do what they want because they're superior to everybody else. No, no, that um, doesn't work. You, that's how you get autocracy. That's how you get, um, that's how you get kind of the situation that we're in right now um, is if you concede participation then you're irrelevant you know so if you want the world to do you want rapture because that is how you get rapture basically um i'm i am critical of the libertarian philosophy of of that mindset for what it's worth um and it's yeah it's because um libertarianism the the key flaw to it is um people are liars um, the problem with a collectivist um, utopia is 
that people are also lazy. Um, you know, so why would I work if I can get fed and have a roof and stuff like that over my head? So it's not about going whole hog one way or the other. You know, there is a certain amount of balance. That's not me advocating for centrism, though. Whoa, the, the left wants us to, you know, uh, work together to improve things, and the right wants to, you know, hunt the homeless for sport. It's like, no, no. That's, you know, let's go in the middle. No, that is a terrible idea. Um, I'm pissing off both sides, so I must be right. No, no. Um, let's see. Laziness drives innovation, though, in it. Yeah, yeah, to a certain extent. Um, all of our technological progress is generally people going, this sucks, what's a better way of doing it? Um, after a certain point. Um, because you kind of first have to be able to have enough free time to tinker with things to build a better mousetrap. Um, if you're focusing on having to always grind your wheat and fetch the water and uh, mend your clothes and things like that, um, that is going to eat up your time and your energy and just your focus so quickly that you don't make any progress. Uh, do you feel we are at a technological level of non-scarcity Assuming we pooled global resources. Well, I guess define non-scarcity. Like, do we have enough food for everyone? Absolutely. But we've been producing enough food to feed the entire human population since the 1800s. It's one of the things that Karl Marx is actually writing about when he writes uh, Das Kapital. Um, the current issue is that under a free market, system that we currently have there's not the incentive to make sure that everybody has food there's a you know there's a moral incentive um but you know it's there's not a profit incentive and right now we have an over emphasis on the profit um motive incentive enough food and space and enough and energy for everyone to live comfortably yeah, yeah, um, yeah, we definitely have enough food. Um, space, oh, absolutely. Like, if you put the entire human species, like, shoulder to shoulder, you know, packed way too closely, um, you could fit us all, I believe it's on the Isle of Man, in between, uh, Great Britain and Ireland. There's an island called the Isle of Man, um, and you could fit the entire human population on it. So, yes, there is enough space for us on this planet. Um, some some space is, is more comfortable than others, but yeah, there is definitely space for us. But it costs a lot of space to feed us. Yes, yes, it does. Um, but as, as I mentioned, we already produce enough food to feed the entire species. Um, so we could definitely do that. It's just a question of being more efficient with how we spread the calories around. Um, and the energy is the one that I still have question marks in my mind about. Um, because it's like, okay, the American lifestyle, um, we use up about a quarter of the planet's resources living our lives the way we do as a society. And that's just not sustainable. Like, if, the, if we raise the entire human population up to an American standard of life, that's not something that's doable in my mind. Like, okay, if we become, you know, an interplanetary species and start having, you know, orbital habitats, and, you know, we can start bringing in asteroids and stuff like that, okay, fine, yeah. Um, but having all seven, eight billion of us living like your average American, that's not a thing that can happen. Um, I don't think we could have all seven, eight billion of us live like a, your average European. Um, and so that's where the current bottleneck kind of is in my mind. Um, you know, it's it's that's going to be kind of the key. Yeah, 
budget. In full agreement, by the way, just picking your brain. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and that's that's kind of why I, I wanted, you know, people to ask questions and stuff like that is I still wanted to kind of convey the thoughts and I don't mind being, you know, uh, challenged and like having people play devil's advocate and stuff like that. That's kind of half the fun of communication of debate is um, is the trading of ideas and the exploration. Um, for me, it's like exploring a map, much like we're doing in, in Valheim right now, or like I was doing um, before I went on my little tangent polemic. Um, but yeah, I do think I do think that getting back to the very first question, do I think that we're in uh, sounds like you're saying we should focus on fusion energy. I do think that is um, absolutely worth pursuing, um, especially with like recent breakthroughs where, you know, we finally got a little bit of energy out compared to what we put in. There's a lot of caveats in there. Like the entire building still required more energy than what came out, but the most recent thing I heard of was there was a fuel pellet that's kind of smashed between what a uh, couple of diamond anvils and you get these big ass lasers this whole chamber full of really powerful lasers and the lasers fire on either you know the anvil on the top or the bottom and they smush the fuel together and that fuses the uh, causes the fusion reaction and um, basically what hit the anvils was smaller than what came out but like the electricity needed to generate all of those lasers it's still running a deficit but progress is progress these sort of things are baby steps so it's absolutely something that needs to keep on being funded because it's going to take a while um okay gear change punic wars how would the world be different had Carthage? not stopped at Rome's gates. Fuel pellet was apparently pretty flawed, by the way, so they think they can get even more with better fuel. Oh, cool. Um, we did see actual fusion, though, for the first time. Oh, plus, um, one of my favorite podcasters, YouTubers, I don't know, Isaac Arthur, has pointed out very fairly that, theoretically, we could do fusion energy right now. All it would take is a very, very big water tank and you detonate a fusion bomb inside of it flash boil the water in it and use that steam to spin a turbine congratulations there is fusion power um it's a lot of space but it's also a lot of a uh, lot of energy you know all of the uh, possible ooh i don't know how i feel about that that you're feeling that's why we don't do that <laughs> but uh but Technically speaking, if we wanted to, we could do it that way. Um, but anyways, Punic Wars. That is one of those kind of butterfly effect sort of things. Because, um, like, the trick is finding the location without pissing people off. Lol. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that's going to be... And even if you do find the place that pisses off the fewest number of people, you are still going to have all sorts of, you know protesters and conspiracy theorists and all sorts of BS that you're going to have to deal with. Um, you know, for God's sake, look at, look at the stupidity that people have around 5G, you know, and that's, that is harmless, you know, versus, oh, hey, yeah, don't mind us. We're just going to routinely be doing fusion explosions in your hemisphere. Um, you know, that's, yeah, that's, that's going to go over like a fart in church. Um, but yeah, um, Punic Wars. Um, had Carthage kept going and not stopped at the gates of Rome, had Carthage basically won the Punic Wars instead of losing them? Okay, so the current status quo is very much heavily influenced on the um, Roman model. You know, you go out, you conquer, you 
get control over distant lands and you take their resources and bring them back to your homeland to, to, to your core to improve your way of life for your own people. Um, you know, the US, the, the Soviet Union, the em European empires, that's, that's a very, that's kind of the model. Um, you have influence over far off places and um, you take their shit and you bring it back and you make your life better, basically. Carthage was much more of a trading empire, you know, so like their military wasn't, you know, their military was a bunch of mercenaries. They were hired because Carthage had boatloads of money, literally. Um, so... I think had they won, and you know, it's kind of implying like, okay, what if Carthage had taken over the, the foundational role that Rome wound up having? Um, I think we might actually be farther along than we are now simply because okay right now we're kind of coming off of the hangover of of might makes right um you know the current the current global order the the status quo is based more on okay no we're gonna you know follow these rules and there's certain things that you can do and certain things that you can't do no matter how powerful you are um doesn't always apply to everybody. See America. Um, see, you know, uh, you know the the people who are currently challenging the status quo. Um, but generally speaking, there's it's it's far more egalitarian. The world is far more egalitarian now than it was a century ago. Um, and a lot of that is based off of the ideals of free trade. Um, like, okay, we're going to leave these people alone to be, to do the things that they're really good at. And we're going to focus on doing the things that we're really good at. And then we can trade with each other. And everybody kind of wins in that situation. As opposed to saying, hey, we're going to take your shit and bring it back to us. Because... In that case, you have resistance to, you know, having your shit stolen. Um, and you're also just taking the raw resources and putting them in a less efficient system. Benign capitalism. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> kind of. Um, and that's, that is, you know, okay, capitalism, in theory, can work very well. It's funny, there's a Herbert Hoover quote, the problem with capitalism is capitalists. They're too damn greedy. Um, and, you know, and it's part of the thing that Marx is also talking about is, um, in, in Das Kapital is, is um, or Communist Manifesto, is that you kind of have to go through the capitalism phase because that generates enough... Um, that generates enough surplus, enough kind of comfort in order to have people look around their world finally and be like, mm, this is kind of bullshit. Um, you know, the, you get the, the, the bourgeois revolution before you get the social revolution. Um, you know, you're, you have the, the middle class merchants and stuff like that challenging the power of the, the, you know, powers that be, the, the autocrats, the, the um, kings and the, the um, you know, theocrats and things like that. Um, and the franchise, the power to determine your nation's course is spread out throughout, you know, property owners. Because 1840s democracy, that's basically what the limitation was like it wasn't poor people working class people they didn't really have a say in things um 
you know, Marx looked around at the state of the democracies he was seeing in the mid-1800s, and it's like, this could be better. Um, you know, the, look at the fact that, like, women couldn't vote, and if you were a racial minority or realistically any sort of minority in one of these random republics or democracies, you weren't treated very well. Um, you know, that's still the case, obviously. That's a lingering legacy, but... Um, but compared to, like, 1850s democracy, democracies right now are better than they were. Um, they can still improve, but they're better than they were. Um, but yeah, so you're supposed to have the, from, it, from his mindset, you're supposed to have the bourgeois demo, uh, revolution, which takes the power from you know, a very select few, and it spreads it out more to kind of the middle class. And then you're supposed to have a social revolution after that, or a, 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 a communist revolution or whatever um, after that, and then the power is spread to the very bottom as well. And the very bottom finally gets a say over the course of their life and the world and their nation and stuff like that. And then everybody gets a say. Um, and then when everybody gets a say, you don't really need these hierarchies of power to, to enforce the, um, the system. It's just like, okay, everybody gets to do stuff, and yeah. Um, that's kind of the end goal. That's why the whole, like, the ultimate goal of, commu uh, of socialism is to get to communism and communism is kind of a stateless society. It's a, it's a, a narco, uh, anarchy. It's basically, it's a functional anarchy, but like in a positive way, like the way that libertarians want, um, you know, the government to get off my back and, you know, I don't want the government telling me what to do. The ultimate goal of communism is nobody's telling you what to do. You know, you're all working out what is going to happen and you do your thing so long as you're not hurting other people. It's kind of the ultimate fulfillment of the li uh, of liberty, which the definition that I was always taught was liberty is the l most freedom that doesn't violate other people's freedom. So, you know, um, so yeah, technically speaking, the law against murder is Oh, technically, that's the government telling me what I can and can't do. Well, yes, but you're seriously fucking up the other person's freedoms and liberties by exercising this freedom over here. So it's like, this is a reasonable infringement. Um, you know, so I always get a little chuckle out of, you know, oh, this law is coercive. All laws are coercive because they're always backed up by, oh, if you don't follow these rules, you have to pay a fine or go to prison and, you know, it's like that's the underlying um, enforcement mechanism is, uh, is technically state violence. Technically. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be that. All intolerance is intolerable. That's why we should suffer Nazis. Oh, yeah. So Star Trek isn't communism. It's hyper-advanced socialism. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Um, yeah. Again, communism itself, like its pure ideals, are utopian. And utopias don't really exist. You know? Um, in fact, the, the book, Utopia, the, I believe the term is kind of a play on words. Um, because it's both like oh this perfect place but you in i think it's greek or latin um can also mean like un or impossible or whatever so another way of translating utopia is the place that doesn't exist um and yeah so i mean to to use i think it's a buddhist phrase or saying or paraphrasing um, you know, suffering will always exist, but that doesn't mean you have to put up with it. <laughs> you know, my, that's kind of my, um, philosophy, I guess, worldview is, yeah, life sucks and you're never going to completely avoid it. Um, uh, you're never going to completely avoid suffering, but 
you know, if you're working to make life better for everybody else, and everybody else is making is working to make life better for their everybody else, well, you're in everybody else's everybody else. So you'll have a whole world that is trying to take care of you. And all you have to do is try to reciprocate. You know, do what you can to make everybody's lives easier. And even if there are people who take advantage of that system, they're inherently a minority. And, you know, it, it, there's, there's a little bit of room for some inefficiencies. Um, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of my worldview, um, outlook for the most part. Um, it's, yeah, life sucks. Reality sucks. It doesn't have to though. Um, and you know, the way I look at it, okay, you know, there are 330 million Americans or something like that right now. Um, you know, you figure that about a third of the country would agree with me, about a third of the country would actively oppose me, and a third just don't really care. Okay, a third of 330 million is 110 million people. Okay, yeah, I'm using all of my energy trying to make life better for 330 million people. I still, in that scenario, have 110 million people trying to make my life better. And 110 million is a hell of a lot more than one, you know? just in case uh, that math needed to be pointed out. So that's why, um, yeah, life is suffering, but that doesn't mean you have to put up with it. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's yeah, I, I think everybody kind of wins in that sort of situation because ultimately, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm being taken advantage of. I'm, I'm people are using my, yeah, yeah, 100, 103, it's, a, it's 110. Uh, million is greater than one. Today I learned. Yeah, yeah, funny how that works out, huh? Um, but yeah, yeah, that's, I feel like that's a, that's a good place to end that rant, diatribe? I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, let me see here. I feel like, yeah. oh wow, I've been going for three and a half hours, but I still feel like going, so... Yeah, let me go ahead and get back into here. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for those questions. I really appreciated that. Um, yeah. Got any more? <laughs> um, let's see here. Let me get some of this food stored away again. I feel like, I don't know, I feel like I could keep on going uh, down that rant, but I don't know. Not rant, but, you know, soliloquy. This, there, that's the phrase I'll use. Um, fuck yeah, I appreciate the answer. I miss picking your brain. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, enjoy having my brain picked. What can I say? Um, <laughs> let's see here. Does this require? Yes, that does require bones. All right, inching closer. Um, yeah, to use uh, the terms from one of our great philosophers, you know, if you've got a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Uh, just check out the hook while DJ revolves it. Yes, I am proud of myself. <laughs> uh, let's see, do you think... MN UFC stands a chance this year. I have no idea. I kind I, I enjoy I enjoy um, soccer, football. I enjoy going to the games. Um, I don't really pay attention to sports teams anymore. Um, it like I get white people enjoy it. I'm not gonna you know piss on anybody's parade or anything like that. It's just I don't find it. I don't find the. I'll go with tribalism, for lack of a better term. Um, I don't like indulging in those instincts, really. Um, the us versus them, that just doesn't sit well with me. Um, you know, hence the, you know, however long rant that I just went on. Um, let's see here. I do not need those. 
themselves. Um, but yeah, so I have no idea um, to answer your question. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. It'd be neat if they did, um, but if they don't, well, I grew up a Minnesota Vikings fan, so I'm very much used to, oh, there's always next year. Um, because that fucking team. Um, and and you can talk to any any Vikings fan, and they will they will be like, yeah yeah that's fair. Um, that is that is that is. I I have learned through many years of getting my hopes up to to not not hitch my emotional well being to to uh, professional athletes. Um, like I wish them well, and I hope they do great. But uh, it's I'm not going to get too involved. Um, just because I've been burned too many times. I can't, I can't take it anymore. I can't be hurt like this no more. Hold on, let me get my brain unmushed. <laughs> no, and it's, it's fine. Like I said, I'm, I'm not here to yuck other people's young. I, you know, if, if people are into sports, that is perfectly fine. Like I said, I get the, the, um, I understand the pleasurable aspects of it. Um, you know, it's just the negatives are kind of too much for me. Um, one of the, like a long time ago, I found out, um, you know, I took a DNA test and uh, turns out I'm 100% that bitch. Um, but uh, um, one of the things that it turns out is with my genetics, I don't have enough, what is it, dopamine receptors, serotonin receptors, something like that. Um, so ADHD medications like Prozac don't work on me because I just don't physically have enough architecture to have the positives, um, you know, get me, or, you know, when everybody has emotional ups and downs. Um, my ups are kind of capped is kind of how it works basically, you know, and I don't know what the right analogy is. If it's, you know, oh, I can, if most people can get to a hundred, I can only get to 98 or I can only get to, you know, 80 or I don't know what the most accurate number to throw out would be, but it's basically there's an upper ceiling on my own internal happiness and it's that's not to be like oh i what is this happiness that you speak of it's like it's not like that um but you know so if you if you take the um the spectrum of like oh you know a hundred percent up and a hundred percent down you know so it all averages out being a sports fan and that's that's great okay well if i'm at you know 80 to minus 100 well that's puts the net average below, you know, it's a net negative. And so it's like, okay, I should probably, uh, I should probably avoid it then. Um, yeah. Next. No. <laughs> but yeah, unfortunately I, um, I also don't know enough about, you know, soccer football to, um, really know oh yeah these people are, are great or these people have our number I know I'm as as a um, born and raised I gotta drop a cue and run oh okay uh, yeah go ahead um, as far as um, uh, what makes a good football team versus a bad football team I haven't spent enough time looking at you know these things so yeah I have no opinion one way or the other yep yep I can't speak. oh yeah no absolutely perfectly fine and I was kind of almost thinking about uh, calling the stream because I have been going for almost four hours at this point um, let's see here and finishing up that big kind of spiel on my worldview and stuff like that kind of felt like, you know, an appropriate place to to end the stream for the day too. So, um, so yeah, feel free to lurk. Um, I don't know 
how much longer I'm going to be doing this anyways, but, uh, you know, as always, I do, I do appreciate the eyeballs and I appreciate, you know, people coming in and, and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> lurk. Uh, oh, got one. If you feel like going on a rant, give me some things that the South did right in the U.S. Civil War. Well, okay, things that the South did right. Trying to get outside recognition from the UK and France. Um, you know, their, their cause was so morally bankrupt that I am definitely having an emotional uh, reaction and I want to be like, oh, nothing! Um, they did tend to be more... Um, Active, at least early on. Um, part of the reason why they struck the Union struggled until Grant was given overall command was everybody on on uh, call me Satan XD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Um, everybody in the command structures on both sides were kind of the product of the same system, and so there was this kind of gentlemanly um, view of war. And so it's like, oh yes, we, we fought hard, and now they've earned the, the, the right to, you know, withdraw and, and, you know, recuperate. And it's like, you know, these are my brothers, we went to West Point together. And it's like, no, these are traitors, they are trying to destroy your country. Um, and... You know, it's the, the the general consensus is that oh, the South had better um, tacticians, had better um, commanders, uh, but the North just had sheer infrastructure and numbers. Um, like, I'm trying to think, what was it? It was okay. The U.S. was about thirty million people at the time, and about two thirds of those, about let's see, the population of the South was about nine million people, if I recall. Of that, about a third of them were enslaved. So there were, at most, like a million people who could fight the war for them. Like, absolutely maximum numbers. Um, versus the North being, let's see, that would have been 20 million. About half of that being men. Uh, be about 10 million. So yeah, like, the, the Union ultimately had a 10 to 1 advantage in just raw numbers. Um, you know, and the whole infrastructure, the rail infrastructure, you know, there's there's all these things as far as why the North was going to win, ultimately. Um, you know, it was, the South never had a chance. Um, so it was just blind, you know, pride and hubris that, that they thought that they could um, by themselves. Um, so their their overall strategy of like, okay, you fight and you fight and you fight and hopefully uh, you can get France and the UK to step in and tell the, the Union to back off. That's not a bad strategy. It's probably the only strategy that really would have worked for them. Um, you know, so going through that route, that probably um, was probably a good idea on their part. Um, I knew it'd do that. I uh, wanted to see if I could get you on a tangent. Love you. Yeah, no, I love you too. Um, and I do appreciate the uh, the tangent fuel. Um, what was it? Um, the Trent Affair. That's the Trent Affair. That's kind of, in my mind, what sealed the South's fate. Um, because the South was trying, the Confederacy was trying to send diplomats into Europe and to, to get the UK and France and stuff like that to, to recognize them as an independent nation. Um, and the North, obviously, was not having that. The, the Union's position was not that the Confederacy was a legitimate government. They were just rebels. It was a rebellion, and they were um, not the valid governance of, government of anything. Um, and so, when they, um, 
um, the South tried to send this ship to, um, tried to send diplomats to England specifically to get recognition. Um, the U.S. boarded a uh, British ship to take these, well, traitors off to, um, you know, prison and stuff like that. And it's like, no, they don't have diplomatic immunity because the South isn't a legitimate country. Um, but it was also a violation of the United Kingdom's um, sovereignty, <laughs> technically. They were violating the sovereignty of an English ship um, by going on and taking passengers off. Um, and that's considered legitimate in times of war. Like, you can take enemy... Uh, it was considered legitimate to take enemy... Um, I think it's called contraband or, or resources. It's, it's legitimate to go on and deny resources to your enemy when you're at war. Um, in the 19th century, at least, it was considered acceptable. Um, and then... But the U.S. wasn't considering itself at war because, oh, this is a rebellion, this is an internal matter, we're not at war with anyone right now. Um, and so the UK is like, okay, if you're not at war with anyone, then what you did is highly illegal in the international order that existed in the 19th century. Um, so that's not cool, man. And France was of the position of like, yeah, you, that's what kind of started the War of 1812. You know, you America, you called it bullshit when when England was doing this to you, and we agreed with you then. Well, if you're not at war with anyone, then what you did is wrong. Um, so it was kind of a sticky situation. Um, and so what wound up happening was, um, you know, through backdoor diplomacy and stuff like that, um, Lincoln ultimately let the Confederate diplomats go. Um, and then, you know, they get to England and the English are like, no, sorry, buddy, you're on your own. <laughs> we're not gonna, we're not gonna help you out. Um, cause the English didn't want to, um, provoke a war with the United States, not because they didn't think they could win, but if they got involved, um, that would give the United States cause for an invasion of Canada. And that's something that they wanted to avoid. Again, not because they didn't think they could win, but because it would be expensive to fight. And it's like, why start this war with these people that we generally like over what? Southern slaveholders? No, no, we're not gonna do this. Um, and yeah, so it was worth a shot from the perspective of the South, but once it once uh, the Trent affair was resolved and and the UK and, and France were like, nah, buddy, you're on your own. That's kind of when their goose was actually cooked. There's there's no coming back from that. Because um, again, ten to one, you know, just manpower numbers and um, you know the industrial capacity. They couldn't build as many guns. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't. Um, get the uh, the trains, you know, the, the infrastructure, the logistics of getting stuff from one part of the Confederacy to the other part was really difficult because there was no, like, standardization. Like, every state basically had a slightly different railroad gauge. You know, they were similar enough, but not quite right. So you couldn't take a train from, like, say, Texas to Georgia. You'd have to, like, switch trains and things like that. Okay, I lied. A, I'm apparently super interested in your answer, even though I tried not to. So I heard all of that, and B, Helen isn't going to bed until later, so I have another question. Yeah, go ahead. Ooh, fish. Fishy, fishy, fish, fish, fish. No, my fish. Um. What do you think the effect of refusing to drop nuclear bombs on Japan would have been? That's a very good question. Um, because part of the debate around the use of nuclear weapons to end the Second World War is that, oh, Japan wasn't going to surrender. It was, it was the, the Soviets declaring war on them that, that caused them to to finally give up, that, that the bombing was needless and, and that. Um, not bad, but rather 
sure she's still playing. Oh, Breath of the Wild. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, fine. Um, brain is mush. That's fine, that's fine. The whole point of, of this is, you know, I'm just rambling and generally providing good voice noises and that, and hopefully that gives endorphins. What can I say? <coughs> um, ultimately, uh, had Japan not surrendered, um, if the U.S. had, um, if the U.S. had not dropped the bombs, I think the war probably, w well, the war would have continued. Um, for how much longer, it's kind of a counterfactual, it's hard to say. Um, but, thinking here. I know that the Americans were planning for an actual invasion of the Japanese homeland. Um, they were going to call it Operation Rainbow, um, and it was going to make um, D-Day look like a cakewalk by comparison, because with Operation Overlord, the D-Day invasion, um, they had the benefit of being able to kind of misdirect the Germans um, and you know they thought the invasion was going to come across um, the narrowest part of the English Channel um, to the point where and you know they were very effective at, at spreading um, that impression like they built up a, a dummy force um, in I think it was Dover whatever the closest part that uh, the part of England that's closest to the channel there um, so the Germans were like, okay, this is where it's coming from. The, we're going to put all of our shit over here. And what they wound up doing was invading across the widest part of the channel so that there was actually the effect that when the actual invasion was happening, the Germans thought it was kind of a feint. They thought that it was designed to pull them away from um, Calais and to, you know, get them out of position. So they sat... Um, and it, you know, it was still a hard-ass landing, but it was made that much easier because they could, because they managed to trick the Germans. Um, that wasn't going to work with Japan um, because there wasn't an alternative to where the U.S. was planning on invading. Because um, they were coming from the south and west um, of, of Japan, and there weren't multiple places that they could invade. Um, they couldn't really go like, you know, they couldn't really do that fake out like they did on Germany. Um, and the Japanese defenders, um, the Japanese had a um, reputation of being incredibly intransigent, uh, intransigent defenders. They were, once they got dug in, it was, you, you had to sacrifice tons of men to take a position. Um, it was going to be bloody. Um, it was so bloody. Uh, it, uh, the, the attritional rates were so bad. Um, as they were preparing for Operation Rainbow, um, they started making a bunch of Purple Hearts uh, medals because they knew people were going to get shot up. A lot of people were going to die. Um, they were still using the Purple Hearts that they made for Operation Rainbow into Afghanistan into the um, post 9-11 wars. Um, that's how bloody they were expecting that to be. Um, I don't know if they've actually ran out of those um, Operation Rainbow Purple Hearts or not, but that's how many they made. Um, so had Japan, had the US not dropped the bombs and had they actually gone through with Rainbow, um, the war would have dragged on, um, because the S Soviet invasion, the original plan without the bombs, um, was that the Soviets were going to go ahead and invade from the north and take the island of Hokkaido. Um, ultimately, had that been what would have happened, um, you probably would have seen a North Japan and a South Japan. Um, like North Korea and South Korea, North Vietnam, South Vietnam. Um, the uh, nation would have been partitioned. Um, uh, 
you know, so that that kind of brings us back to the question of did the bombs actually make Japan um, surrender? And I'm trying to think here because because there was definitely a faction that was very much no, let's keep on keep the war going on. Um, you know, make them bleed out, bleed them white, basically. Japan didn't think they were going to win, um, but they thought that maybe they could make the Allies bleed enough to just kind of give up. Um, so let me think. The... Yeah, if Truman decided, no, let's not do this... Um, Do you think the effect of refusing to drop the bombs on Japan would have been? Um, had Truman said no, um, we would have wound up um, doing Operation um, Rainbow. Hokkaido would have fallen under Soviet influence. We might still have a, you know, Stalin-influenced North Japan. Um, not to mention the total number of deaths would have been higher um, because not only would you have okay so with the nukes being used you have the devastation of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki terrible terrible loss of life not going to argue against that um, had they not had the bombs not been dropped um, those cities would have still had to have been invaded and taken, and so the percentage of those cities' populations would dying, the number of people in those particular cities that would have died in that invasion would have been lower, but it wouldn't have been just those two cities. It would have been, you know, um, it would have been basically every city from the south all the way up to central uh, Japan. It would have been um, you know, Nagano, it would have been it would have been um, Hiroshima, it would have been Nagasaki, it would have been um, it would have been Osaka, it would have been Kyoto, it would have been all these cities because the plan was to make the allies bleed just a gallon of blood for every thimble that they lost. That was the whole plan. Um, was to make the Allies pay for it. Um, and so ultimately, the civilian deaths would have been even higher. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's ultimately, it, you know, it's the bombs being dropped isn't a good thing. It isn't something that should be celebrated, but it's like the least bad option. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, that's kind of where I come down on it. It's, it's like, you know, should it have happened? Probably not. But then again, the whole goddamn war probably shouldn't have happened. It's, was unnecessary. Um, but it happened. So, you know, where can you go from there sort of thing? So, yeah. Um, okay, I think, therefore I am, kappa kappa kappa. Wait, I am now distracted. I'm trying to go more esoteric for the next one. You're too good. I'm just, I'm just chatting and I, I like these sorts of questions. I like the um i like thinking about this sort of stuff um oh, press the uh windows button pulled up my start menu that's not what i wanted um
this point, if I get one more troll, I'll have enough troll height to actually finish my troll set, which will be nice, because then I'll be stealthier. In your opinion, what was the most impactful invention of human history? Okay. I'm thinking. Um, okay, so there's, let's see, there's always the, um, the classics, fire, the wheel, the magnetic compass, the iron plow, the gunpowder. In your opinion, what was the most impactful invention of human history? Thinking agriculture because agriculture leads to like settlement and um, uh, you can do top five if you want fair enough um, I think agriculture is the ultimate one though um, that are like hurting you know pastoralism basically generating food surpluses um, because once you have a food surplus then you can have specialization, like, you know, was mentioning earlier. Um, all the other things about humanity um, start happening because you don't have to spend every day of your life, you know, avoiding predators and trying to be a predator or trying to graze. Um, familiar with... Gobekli Tepe. Yes, I vaguely, if I recall correctly, it's a possibly 10,000-year-old settlement in Anatolia, the Turkish peninsula. Um, yeah, if, if it's the, yeah, I believe it's that. Again, pulling this out of the, uh, out of my backside. Uh, 13,000 at the oldest parts at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because um, prior to that, the current estimate was that, generally speaking, behaviorally modern humans, like us, really kind of start, excuse me, about 10,000 years ago. Um, like, the species was alive, you know, prior to that, but... If you took like a baby born from then and brought it to today, it could grow up in our societies with no issues. Um, before then, there's enough differences in like brain structures and things like that where, yeah, we could reproduce with people from that time, but they might have learning disabilities, things like that is my understanding, um, which seems to indicate that we could have seen specialization without agriculture, but may have taken more time. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there are, there are, like, pastorals that, you know, live just fine. Um, what is it? The, uh, uh, Kosan, uh, people. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, the Kosan people, um, you know, spend less energy and have more calories, um, in their daily diet than, you know, historically most humans throughout recorded human history. Um, so up until fairly recently, if you want to look at it that way, technically they were, they had a much better system going. Um, but that's, um, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, we could have seen, uh, just a second. Um, Specialization without agriculture, uh, but may have taken more time. Um, work, fair enough. Um, later still, sure, sure, sure. And I'm, I'm kind of piecing my thoughts together on it as well. Uh, Yeah, because I know, um, let's see, part of the debate around Gobekli Tepe is 
whether or not it was like what f role it f uh, served. Like it could be that it was just kind of like um, the annual swap meet sort of thing. Like the different pastoral tribes of, in the area that weren't you know, specialized into um, agriculture and, and kind of sedentary existence. Um, sedentary, I don't think that's the right term, but for lack of a better term. Um, it's possible that there might have been people just like living there and, you know, they, they would go out and do their herding and stuff like that. So, yeah, it is possible to have a... Um, a uh, pastoral society without agriculture um the fact though that you don't really see it happening that often means i think that agriculture is a little bit easier to get cities out of and stratification specialization um and all of those things that come out of that um Yeah, I'm not saying, yeah, yeah, I'm not saying that you have to have agriculture in order to get, you know, uh, civilization, as we call it, um, you know, to get to where we are today. Um, but I think it's a easier path. Um, let's see here. Invention of fire. I wouldn't necessarily call it an, in well... I guess I wouldn't call agriculture necessarily an invention. It's more of a learned behavior and taming fire. That's more of a uh, that's more of a uh, discovery. It's like that's more figuring out how burning things works. The wheel not necessary because um, you look at. Um, the Inca Empire, the, the New World, really didn't have wheels. Um, those massive empires, they still had thriving civilizations, thriving cultures. Um, you know, wheeled carts don't work very well in the um, land of the Inca um, because there's such a vertical component to it. It's, you know, you can't really do the, the hairpin turns like like we do now with our cars and stuff like that it doesn't work all that well it's such it's the benefits of the wheel and axle drop considerably in that sort of environment um whereas like stairs and having porters is is kind of the easier way of dealing with things there um but there with the inca they had tons of different varieties of potatoes so there you have agriculture leading to the basis of a uh, of a very functional society um let's see here yeah yeah most uh but then okay let's see changing things up a little bit as far as what works the best for or most impactful invention that's not you know Kind of those big ones like what's the most important gadget mm. I'm trying to think maybe the invention of like ranged combat because it's like okay yeah guns are very impactful um but realistically they're building off of the um success of bows and javelins and atlatls and things like that um the whole i want to poke holes in that person over there but i don't want them poking holes in me so i'm going to put some distance between us um i think that is probably the like gadget thing that probably had the most impact because it's because ranged combat like that can also be useful in um, food gathering, um, you know, hunting and stuff like that. Um, it's it's a good way of um, securing resources. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Most impactful invention in human history. 
Yeah. Um, it also actually, range combat, it also kind of builds off of our, um, the human species amongst primates, we're really good at throwing things. Like, we can throw farther and more accurately than, than our um, primate relatives. Um, and so it kind of makes sense that we would then try to maximize that, because um, cause that's kind of the, the, that's kind of leaning into our specialization. Um, we tend to be more uh, persistence hunters. We don't, you know, rush up to our, our prey and take it down that way because, you know, deer, ungulates, cattle, all, all that stuff, you know, they tend to outrun us. Um, but humans are kind of the Michael Myers of the animal kingdom in that we just keep on coming. Um, and so using the, uh, the uh, Kosan people of Namibia, as, as an example, what they tend to do is they tend to run down their prey. Um, they go hunting in the hottest part of the day and just chase their prey to exhaustion. Um, you know, they just, you know, freaking die of heat stroke, basically. Um, yeah, because we've got advantages, like, with our sweat system, our sweat glands and things like that, we can... Um, do better in those temperatures than our prey does, and that tends to um, help us out in, you know, running them down. Did I completely run out of copper? Yeah. That's why I took the card out there. Yep. Okay, so I need to find a new source of copper. So I'm going to take a nap here, and then we need to get back to the farthest point. Get out to the farthest point to do a, um, find some more copper.
Oh, I need more leather scraps. All right, right, I can do all of... Yeah, doy, I can do all of these, uh, make all these tools that I've been wanting to do, and, yeah. All right, uh, X. this I guess after the fact way early on at the start of the stream I was like oh I can't remember what the what the hold up why I can't make uh, the good boat yet it's because I don't have the right kind of wood yet and I couldn't make it because I didn't have a bronze axe so now that I do have a bronze axe that is going to change let's see ah, there it is perfect time Fine wood, that's what I was needing. There we go, the carve, that's what I was wanting to build this whole time. And the fermenter. Not quite enough. Okay, well, let me... That... Should have enough weight... Capacity. 
capacity to do that. Yep. Okay. Not quite enough wood. Not quite enough. Na or no nails. Put that there. That there. That there. don't have enough bronze is what I'm guessing. Yeah. Oh, wait. Maybe. I got ten. Yeah, I only need to be able to make... Yeah, do this four times. Awesome! Birch, you're a fine wood. What a good boat you would be. So I'm gonna chop you down. Like that. Drops, certain cores, and bird feathers, and bones. Hoping for can make some minor stamina potions. there just temporarily. Okay. 
so. a good place to call it for today because yeah now we're sitting at four and a half hours unless can i find one more birch tree yep there it is perfect 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 i can find two more birch trees three is the limit Work, I'm gonna need 40. So, what I'm thinking at this point, I'm gonna get another up this uh, fine wood that I need and then I am eventually going to once I have enough materials for two portals I think I'm gonna go ahead and end the stream and we'll pick it up next week where we actually start doing some more um, exploration of the map and stuff like that probably finally get a chance to go all the way over to the elder and fight him or yeah I'm trying to think can I please that big tree bastard uh Male or female? Yeah. We'll put the fire to him. Either way. Somebody messing with my boat. Yes. Freaking froggy bastards. Hey, you kids, get away from my boat! Writing the snack. Come on. Drop bass ditches. Have shit in the tree. Closest to the this thing hub. Okay, now we've got enough fine wood for two portals. All right, so now we need 
20 gray dwarf eyes and four certain cores. I do believe I already have that. Yep, and just yet. Okay, so, brief demonstration of portals. First, you put one portal down, and then you can name a portal. Oh, why hello, Christopher Squawkins. Let's go ahead and uh, get your uh, explanation first. Uh, portals are great for fast travel between different parts of the world. Of course, you need to build one on the other end as well. Then give the pair the same name and they will automatically connect it. They will be automatically connected. Okay, I thought your grammar was a bit off there, Bert. But no, you're good. You're good. Squawkin' away! Alright, so yeah. We could say home or nothing. Um, and go ahead and put another one over there. And since they have the same title... Hey, look, they're connected. And so I walk through this one, and it gives me this little swirly Eye of Sauron, you know, wormhole thingy going. And I pop over here. And the nice thing about portals is they can connect anywhere on the map. There are some restrictions on them, like you can't bring raw ore or metals. Right? Is it raw ore? Yeah, yeah, because once it's smelted, it's fine. You can't bring raw... Oh! Okay, so this little symbol here, uh, this wormhole with an X through it, means it can't be teleported. So this stuff you have to physically lug from one part of the map to the other. Um, that is the restriction on them. There's a few things like that uh, throughout the game, but that's generally the biggest roadblock you're going to hit. Um... So yeah, let's see here. So yeah, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to keep the parts for this portal in the hold of my ship, along with, well, we'll put a little bit of wood there. Um, yeah, and now we can go out and explore the world and, you know, see what's over here and not have to sail all the way back, drop stuff off, deal with it like we've been doing the last couple of weeks. Um, and as a result, yeah, we can start kind of building up, leveling up a little bit. Um, yeah, so let me go ahead and add some more wood to the charcoal. That's good, that's full. Get a little more honey. Lay down and take a nap. And yeah, see. So, we've been in Valheim for over a month now. Um, let's see here. Okay. Yeah. At this point, I think we are good. I'm just going to load everything. Yeah, we'll put this here. And then we'll go ahead and call it. give a very big thank you for everyone who lent, uh, loaned me your eyes and um, asked questions and generally just kind of help participate in the show, help, you know, kind of give it a reason to exist. Um, yeah, I like the fact that I've been able to do this every Wednesday for, well, three weeks, maybe two weeks. I don't know, one of the, one of the four weeks 
I didn't do it on a Wednesday, but I, I feel like Wednesday is a, a sustainable sort of date, so I plan on keeping on keeping on with that. Um, still planning on doing three to four central time. Um, and yeah, I think I'm gonna go ahead and call it here and we'll pick this up next week where we finally do some exploration. And yeah. Yeah, just one last time. Thanks everyone for showing up. And I am Miyumi, and I'll see you next time.